General Manager of WBAI, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this very special forum called Haiti, an Eyewitness Report. It's being sponsored by WBAI Pacifica Radio as part of our 35th anniversary, 35 years of extraordinary, powerful programming on issues like Haiti, East Timor, the budget, uh, national elections, Nicaragua, you name it, WBAI has been there. In this event, and for this event, our partner has also been Mouvement Paysan um, Education and Development Fund, the Nation Institute, and New Channels Communication. Before we begin this program, a moment of silence for all those killed everywhere, from Oklahoma City to Port-au-Prince, by hate groups, by fascist movements, by paramilitary organizations that all go by the name of death squads. A moment of silence. Haiti, as many of you know, and it's the reason you're here today, has known this reality for many more than 40 years. First as the Tonton Makut, and now the frap, and always the deaths, the beatings, the tortures, and the dream of democracy that seems forever, ever deferred. But more of that during today's program. It's my pleasure to welcome our special guest for this program, and I'm going to start out with the speaker who, in fact, will cap this program, and that's, of course, Professor Noam Chomsky, scholar, renowned author, policy analyst, and one of the best minds on any planet in this solar system, and he's with us today. We also have the distinct pleasure of hearing uh, Alan Nairn, who's a journalist, who is the writer for The Nation magazine, and who just won one of the most celebrated awards in all of journalism, the George R. Polk Award, Alan Nairn. And we have on the podium one of the um, leaders of one of the most important organizations in terms of protecting what we've been trying to do for 35 years, your First Amendment rights, freedom of expression, and freedom of the press. It's our pleasure to have Ron Daniels on the platform with us today <laughs> in the Center for Constitutional Rights. Of course, there's a voice and many voices that you will recognize today, and one of them is the news director who has covered Nicaragua, Mexico, especially East Timor, and now very much Haiti, WBAI's own news director, Amy Goodman. <laughs> When I was in Haiti in 1985, in 1986, in 1987, 1988, covering elections, covering massacres, covering bodies on the streets, covering journalists being killed, covering the um, absolute uh, negation and denial of the democratic impulses and struggles of the Haitian people, throughout all those years, there was one man and one name that I heard about, that I saw, that I recorded. It's almost 10 years now. He's the leader of the largest peasant movement, and Haiti is mostly a peasant country. Um, you know about the illiteracy rate there. You know about much about Haitian history. It is the peasants that are the backbone of the struggle for democracy, have always been in the forefront um, for a democratic and pluralistic Haiti. There's nobody like him, and it's our pleasure today. He's come right from Haiti to be at this event, Chavan Jean-Baptiste. <laughs> He 
before I introduce the other very hard worker who has been working for Haiti and many other progressive causes, I'd like to thank many of the WBAI staff who helped us organize this event, including Lois Henry, Sybil Wong, Samori Marksman, um, Arnold Friedman, many volunteers who helped us uh, this afternoon and throughout the week. Uh, Dave Burstein is here. And now I want to introduce Lori Richardson, who started working in this, on this idea weeks and weeks ago. She is with Mouvement Paysan um, Papay uh, in Boston. So from Boston to New York, we organized and telephone called and conferenced, and she went to Washington. They did an event there. We've been trying to help each other all the way along because Haiti is so important. So it is my great pleasure to introduce the other co-sponsoring organization here and the other co-worker on this wonderful event, and I'm so glad so many of you have turned out, and that is Lori Richardson. It's really great, great to see everyone here today in order to dialogue with a very distinguished panel and to talk about what lies ahead, not only for those of us that are working on democracy, human rights, and economic justice in Haiti, but increasingly all of those issues that have relevance here in the United States. We of the Mouvement Paysan Papay Education and Development Fund are very happy to be here this afternoon to present the event to you along with WBAI, the Nation Institute, and New Channels Communications. We're an organization that was born in 1991 after one of the members of the peasant movement of Papai, Basle Jean-Baptiste, who's seated right over here and who is an agronomist with the MPP, and Chavon Jean-Baptiste's brother was blocked out of Haiti after the coup d'etat. And as activists in Boston talked about how to make the U.S. public understand what was happening in Haiti and what the U.S. government was doing, the MPP Education and Development Fund was begun. Our mission is to link efforts for structural change in Haiti and in the United States because, as we well know, the same struggle that's being waged in Haiti is a struggle that we are waging here in the United States. We link up activists in the United States, whether they're people working in the labor movement, people working in the student movement, people working on human rights, people working on issues of U.S. policy. We link them up with their counterparts in Haiti. We monitor events in Haiti, and we work to pressure the U.S. government to change its policy. But we're pretty clear that that's a long struggle. And so in the meantime, one of our major foci is to bring the voice of Haiti's popular movement up to the United States, the voice that's too often absent from the debate in the United States about what U.S. policy should be, what the impact of U.S. policy is. The popular movement in Haiti has been active since 1986. It burgeoned. It brought down the Duvalier dictatorship. It refused in the years after 1986 to accept Duvalierism without Duvalier. It was responsible for the election of Haiti's first democratically elected president, President Jean-Bertrand Aristide, and its resistance was the key to President Aristide's return, even if his return did not occur, perhaps, in the way that the popular movement would have envisioned, as we'll hear more about this afternoon. It was the resistance of Haiti's people and their popular organizations that forced the international community in the United States to have to resolve the question and bring President Aristide back to Haiti in October of last year. One of the other activities of the MPP Education and Development Fund is to facilitate the exchange of technical and material resources between the community in the United States and the popular movement in Haiti. And that is not only material support, but also political support, because as we'll be hearing this afternoon, the voices, and as I've just said, of the peasants, of the workers, of the students, of the women, of people in marginalized communities, too often don't make it up here. And it's our responsibility as U.S. citizens, whose government is so involved in Haitian history, to act to counterbalance that. And one of the ways that we can do that is not only to provide material support, but also to provide political support. Without further ado, 
I'd like to turn over the program to this evening's or this afternoon's moderator, that is Ms. Amy Goodman, which has already received a wonderful introduction, who I've had the uh, opportunity and the pleasure to be with in Haiti, and I'm very happy to introduce her to you today. Ms. Amy Goodman. I want to thank everyone for coming today. It's nice to know there's someone on the other end of that microphone when we wake up in the morning. Um, because Valerie has introduced the speakers for today, I just thought I'd share two experiences very briefly before we go to our first speaker. Um, it was my time in Haiti. Uh, I'd, I'd gone down to Haiti when uh, President Aristide was returning. And in the last few days, as we've been preparing for this event, and at the same time, uh, some of the motives and some of the people who may have been behind the Oklahoma bombing uh, have been becoming clearer. I've had a very strange experience um, uh, of a kind of coming together of the two uh, situations, believe it or not, the Oklahoma City bombing and Haiti. Right after Aristide returned, there was a large demonstration against the U.S. forces in Haiti because of their close relationship with FRAP and how they were working with the Haitian Armed Forces and FRAP, the paramilitary organization there. Uh, there were many Haitians who were, Joe, are you, okay. Um, there were many Haitians who were uh, protesting this relationship in a place called Petit Guave and Grand Guave, about an hour outside of Port-au-Prince. After this protest, um, I went to Grand Guave to meet with the special forces where they were stationed to find out about their relationship and how they perceived their relationship with the people, with the armed forces, and with FRAP. And I met one commander, one, one of the soldiers in the special forces, trained particularly in counterinsurgency. And after discussing a few things on mic and on the record, after I closed my mic, he started to really talk. He brought me up to the second floor of the Haitian military barracks where his office was. He closed the door. He took out a stack of papers. There were 89 pieces of paper, each of them a membership application of a member of FRAP with their photograph and their full family history and what they did. He said, these are the people we're working with. When I asked him about Lavalas and Aristide, he muttered, communists, stone communists. And then I asked him about what he was doing there then, if that's since he was coming back to shore up Aristide, and he said, that's a good question. He said, what these people are about and what that guy in the palace is about is redistributing the wealth, expropriating property, and tyranny of the poor, getting something for nothing. He talked about the FRAP and the military there as people who had businesses, landowners, people who had something to lose. He had told them, he said, to stay in their houses. He had said they did not disarm them as long as they didn't take their weapons into the streets. He had said they were the first group, the FRAP, that he had come, that he had met with in Grand Guave, that yes, the Haitians who were protesting were right, because he said they were the only organized responsible group. And he showed me as proof the membership application as each, of each member of FRAP. He then went on to talk as the sun was going down, to rail against the one world government, the socialist world bank, and he got angrier and angrier as he talked about the lack of direction in the America today and how he would be leaving the military because, precisely because of what he was doing in Haiti and he wanted that to stop and said he would continue to work with the forces he was in Haiti. I said, how many others of the soldiers you work with, there was a group, a dozen of them, feel the same way you do? And he said, 11 of the 12. Well, certainly the Haitians in that area understood it. He said that the leader of the Lavalas in that area was in the next town. There was a priest there whose arm, who only had half an arm, and he said, the leader of the Lavalas is that asshole with a Bible under his stump. That's how he viewed the overwhelming majority of the people of Haiti. He called them street shit continually as he talked about them, said they were unemployed and they were students and they would take whatever they could get. 
And as this whole week has unfolded with the Oklahoma bombing, I could only think back to this man as they described the people possibly involved with the Oklahoma bombing, disgruntled military men, well-trained in explosives and uh, use of weapons. And I keep thinking of this soldier in Grand Guave. The other experience leads right into today, which is the day after Aristide returned. Aristide's return was quite an anticlimax for many people in Haiti. He returned on a military jet, came in, spoke behind plate glass, uh, spoke behind bulletproof glass. The people very far in the distance kept away from the palace, very different from his inauguration day, when he actually washed the feet of peasants in the palace to show his connection to the people of Haiti. It may well have been a disappointment to him, but it certainly was a disappointment to the people of Haiti as they came out in the thousands to greet him, but were kept far away by the U.S. forces. Well, the next day after Aristide returned, we went out on a five-hour drive to Hanch, following Chavon Jean-Baptiste, one of our speakers today, who was returning to his home after years in exile during the coup. As we drove out, we were coming just over a hill before we arrived in Hanch. And before us were more than 10,000 people who had streamed out, who had walked for many hours, some more than a day, to greet this leader of the peasant movement of Papai, a man who had been working to bring down baby Doc Duvalier, trained hundreds of peasant organizers over the years, had to leave because of the coup, and now was returning. The Haitians could touch Siobhan, and they came out to do it. And as he came in a caravan with Basile Jean-Baptiste and other supporters, they crowded around him, they shouted, they danced, and they sang. And this was the kind of homecoming that I think many had hoped would be the scene for Aristide. But he had been surrounded by U.S. forces, and Siobhan Jean-Baptiste wasn't. And that's the kind of support that Siobhan has out in the countryside because of his years of working with the peasants in Haiti. And so we very much look forward to hearing from him today as he's just flown up uh, to address this group and to go around the country to talk about the situation in Haiti right now, one you won't see described on the front page or even the inner pages of the New York Times. But before we go to Siobhan and to Noam Chomsky, who will be wrapping up this program today. We're going to turn first to Alan Nairn, a journalist well known to many of you who's been working in Latin America for the last 15 years, most recently been working on Haiti, returned from a five-week trip there. As Valerie said, uh, he's just recently won the George Polk Award and the James Aronson Award for Social Justice Journalism for his three-part series on Haiti in The Nation magazine. Uh, the first one being Occupation Haiti, predicting what the occupation would look like. The second uh, being, just as he revealed the connection between the FRAP and Emmanuel Constant, who headed up this Haitian paramilitary organization that has so terrorized the Haitians over the last few years, and the CIA and other intelligence agencies within the U.S. government. So without further ado, Alan Nair. Thank you. Um, both Valerie and Amy mentioned the, uh, the Oklahoma City bombing. And one thing that's, that's very striking about that is that this is one of those occasions, one of those fairly rare occasions, where Americans, people living in this country, are actually able to feel and to see in a graphic way and experience uh, some of the emotions that are connected with the explosion of bombs and the discharge of guns. Um, usually, those of us who live in this country have the political luxury of being able uh, to think about those things in abstract or distant terms, especially if you live in the uh, 
the top two-thirds of the society economically who don't have to worry about them on the street every morning. And we hear it discussed in Washington. We hear the, uh, the pundits and the politicians talking about the dispatch of bombs, the dispatch of guns to this or that country, and it's, it's framed as a policy discussion. It's framed as something dignified and elevated. But when we see these TV pictures from Oklahoma City, those little kids with their limbs torn off, and the, uh, you hear accounts of uh, the rescuers finding a finger here and a, a head there, a body part there, you get a bit of a sense of the, the real human horror, the utter terror that lies at the end of these, the explosion of these munitions. Now just imagine this. Imagine if it turned out that when the people who had perpetrated this bombing were, were rounded up, if it turned out that those people were on the payroll of a foreign government, and it further turned out that the idea for putting together the terrorist cell that had launched this attack had actually originated in the embassy of that foreign government in Washington, that one day the uh, military attaché for that foreign government, which by the way is, say, 300 times the size of the United States, uh, and which has a vast uh, military, and which is just a few miles off the shore uh, of the United States, this vast uh, looming power, it turned out that the military attaché had approached some unsavory characters and said to them, you know, it might be a good idea in terms of the way we see we would like to influence uh, American politics if you formed a group that could counterbalance uh, some of the, the forces that we find uh, objectionable. And they had launched this group on its way and they had been paying them. And at the time of the detonation, uh, these people were actually agents uh, of a foreign uh, government. And further imagine that Oklahoma City was just another day's work for this foreign-funded, foreign-created uh, group, and that over the course of, say, three years, for example, they exacted a death toll through terrorist uh, bombings, through assassinations, through dragging people from their homes in the middle of the night and hacking off their arms uh, with machetes and hacking off their ears with machetes and dumping their bodies uh, on the roadside and strolling into a neighborhood, say, Upper Manhattan, and putting it uh, to the torch. And that over the course of, say, three years, this foreign-created and funded terrorist group killed, uh, let's say, 1.5 million American civilians, all with a political motive. Just, just imagine that um, and just try to get a sense of uh, what that would do uh, emotionally and psychologically and politically uh, to the people uh, of this uh, country, as wealthy uh, and as uh, strong as this country is. And when you start to imagine that, when you start to project that, you get just an inkling, just a very uh, small inkling, just a pale imitation of what, has, what it has been like for the residents of Haiti, for whom this latest spasm of foreign-funded uh, terrorism has been just another incident in a very long uh, history of state-sponsored terrorism brought in by this looming foreign power more than 300 times their size uh, next door. The analogy, of course, in Haiti is the FRAP, the FRAP of Emmanuel uh, Constant, U.S. government employee on the payroll of the CIA encouraged to form the FRAP by Colonel Patrick Collins, the Defense Intel Intelligence Agency attaché working out of the U.S. Embassy uh, in Port-au-Prince, and simultaneously detailed by the CIA to a group called the SIN, the National Intelligence Service, uh, where he teaches a course on liberation theology. Uh, liberation theology being, as Constant tells his students, the military uh, intelligence operatives who were engaged in a program of terrorizing uh, catechists and other church people in the countryside. Liberation theology being this dangerous notion that the poor ought to be empowered, that they ought to be able to go to the rich and make demands. 
And as Constant explained to me in this course that he was teaching for the CIA to the CIA-created unit, one of his messages was, there is not just one Aristide. There are tens of Aristides out there. There are Aristides who can come out of the woodwork at any moment, so you must be constantly vigilant, constantly ready to put them down. Now, I think later Professor Chomsky will give you more of the, the history and the, the context uh, of this. But to really understand what the U.S. has been doing in, uh, in Haiti, you have to look back a few years and realize that in many ways the, the motive force behind the U.S. policy has been the fear of a popular movement, the fear of the population organizing and stepping forward and seizing control of Haitian society and the Haitian government. Take the case of the Duvaliers. For many years, the Duvaliers were favored clients of Washington. U.S. Marine missions came in to train the Tonton Makuts. The CIA came in to train uh, the Makuts. Washington was happy with the Duvaliers, but in late 85, early 86, as popular movements started to surge, it looked like they were losing, it looked like Baby Doc was losing its grip. The U.S. decided, this looks too dangerous. It's time to go. We have to ease them out. Colonel Stephen Butler, who was the U.S. Pentagon official in charge of military planning for the Caribbean at the time, explained that they feared that if Baby Doc stayed in, they would have a popular uprising on their hands. So the alternative was to move him out, bring in another military group. Now, the military officers who the U.S. supported in the, the coup that ousted Baby Doc were actually engaged in running cocaine into the United States, as Butler explained. He also explained the U.S. had known for a number of years that Baby Doc himself was running cocaine in the United States. U.S. radar in the, in the, in the Dominican Republic had actually spotted planes taking off uh, from one of uh, Baby Doc's farms uh, flying the drugs into the U.S. But none of that had been sufficient reason for the U.S. to pull the plug on him. That reason only came when it looked like he was losing his repressive force, and the U.S. might be facing the, facing the danger of an actual popular uprising in Haiti. And they opted to replace him, not with a popular force, but with another group of criminals, a group of criminals who it seemed to Washington could maintain control. Now, in this period, there was a certain chaos on the political scene. Popular groups were coming forward on every front. The old Tonton Makut apparatus was in disrepair. So it was at this moment that the CIA stepped in to launch the SIN, while the U.S. Congress had ostensibly, legally and above board, cut off U.S. military aid to Haiti. A group that terrorized Haitian dissidents engaged in surveillance on a national scale. It wasn't enough, though. It wasn't enough to crush the Haitian popular movement, which continued to grow in force. In 1990, Washington decided that to stabilize the situation, it would make more sense to have a legitimate elected president. Mark Bazan was the U.S. candidate. The U.S. sponsored elections. At the last moment, though, the popular movement, completely confounding the plans of the U.S. Embassy, put forward Aristide as the candidate. He swept to victory before the U.S knew what had happened, and within weeks, Colonel Collins from the embassy was approaching Emmanuel Constant, saying, we need a force. We need a force to counterbalance the popular movement, to counterbalance Aristide. This was what became the terrorist frap. Now, in the ensuing years of the coup regime, the death toll, perhaps 5,000 civilians, murdered not just by Constant, but by the forces directed by Sidras, Francois, also U.S. government employees, also in the pay of the CIA. The U.S. on paper was opposed to this regime. They supposedly wanted them to leave, but they kept paying those who were directing the terror. They kept paying those who were overseeing the terror, and simultaneously were using that terror to twist the arm of Aristide. 
In Washington, Aristide was being given a set of conditions. The U.S. saw that it had a problem with the coup regime. The coup regime was not consolidating control. They were not succeeding in obliterating the popular movement. Haiti remained unstable. Investors did not want to come in. Refugees were still fleeing to Florida, creating political problems for the Democrats in Florida who hoped to hold on uh, to that state as they finally did in the elections uh, after, the, uh, after it was clear that Aristide, uh, after the return of Aristide. The U.S. realized at a point that they had to bring Aristide back. That was the only way to stop the flow of refugees. That was the only way to stabilize the situation, but with, it, with conditions. They wanted Aristide without the old Aristide platform, Aristide without the popular movement. Lawrence Pizzullo, the former U.S. envoy to Haiti, explained to me that in their negotiations with Aristide, they used the terror of the FRAP. Now, Pizzullo denied any knowledge of the U.S. connection to the FRAP, but he said that in October of 93, as the killing was rising, uh, uh, the FRAP terror was rising to its peak, the U.S. sat Aristide down and said, look, the FRAP has now become the dominant force on the ground. The only way to counteract that is for you to join with us and move to the right, bring old Duvalier elements uh, into, your, uh, into your government. I mean, think about that. Think about the cynicism of that. Above ground, you have the U.S. declaring for democracy, saying Aristide is our man. Underground, you have U.S. government employees slaughtering the constituents of Aristide. And behind closed doors, the U.S. negotiators saying to Aristide, you know, we got a problem here with all these uh, uh, terrorist killings. The only way to stop this is for you to move our way. Most importantly, signing on to a World Bank IMF structural readjustment plan, which, if finally implemented, would probably be the most radical ever attempted anywhere in the world, involving a whole range of measures from laying off half of government employees to privatizing all significant uh, state enterprises, creating special uh, parallel courts that would be more favorable to corporations, uh, direct subsidies to export uh, corporations, laying aside the old agenda of dramatic increases in the minimum wage, redistribution of land, redistribution of wealth, overturning the table of exploitation, and so forth. Aristide signed on to that program. The U.S. brought him back. And now you have a situation where in the countryside in Haiti, as a result of an order that came down from, through the U.S. military chain of command in October of 1994, where the U.S. Special Forces are collaborating directly with the FRAP, as Amy mentioned with that example. This is not the initiative of individual Special Forces units. This is policy from Washington. It's not just that the paramilitaries have not been disarmed. The paramilitaries have been politically aided and abetted and protected by the U.S. occupation forces. The night of Aristide's uh, return, we went over to the Army General Staff Headquarters uh, just across the street uh, from the palace in Port-au-Prince, and we're up there standing on the balcony talking to a, a young Haitian-American uh, U.S. soldier who had left Haiti when he was young and had now uh, returned with the U.S. troops. And we were looking out at the crowds of people in the street and he said, you know, if we weren't here, if we weren't here to protect this building, they'd burn this place down. This, uh, this, this building would be cinders. This army would disappear overnight. He knew very well from his own experience and from the people who he had been talking to who the U.S. troops were protecting. Major Lewis Kernison, who was Colonel Pat Collins' assistant in the Defense Intelligence Agency office in Port-au-Prince, and who was then put in charge of the police training programs in Haiti, uh, he explained it to me this way. This was right before the occupation. This is the way he, uh, he said, um, uh, who are we going back to save? You're going to end up dealing with the same folks as before, the five families that run the country, the military and the bourgeoisie. They're the same folks that are supposed to be the bad guys now, but the bottom line is you know that you're always going to end up dealing with them. It's not going to be the, sl the slum guy from Cité Soleil the best thing he can hope for is probably, oh, I'll help you offload your cargo truck. 
because that's all he has the capacity to do. It'll be the same elites, the bourgeoisie and the five families that run the country. That was Kernison right before the occupation. As it's played out, it has worked out that way. Now you have Aristide back, but coming out of Aristide's mouth is the economic program of Mark Bazan, the World Bank IMF structural readjustment even more radical than that which Bazan had ever dared to propose. Now within Haiti, there are popular movements like the MPP, which are trying to push in the other direction, which are trying to resist, which are trying to enable Aristide to slip out of the straitjacket, the political and military straitjacket which has been imposed on him by the United States. But people in this country should understand very clearly that that's where the initiative comes from in Haiti. That's where the movement for change in Haiti comes from, from the grassroots groups. It is not going to come from Aristide himself and from the Aristide administration. When you talk to Aristide and his Aristide people about this and say, well, what about the old program of overturning the table of exploitation? What about uh, redistributing wealth, redistributing land, uh, et cetera? What they'll say is, look, we are surrounded. We don't have an army on the streets. Those are not our troops. Those are U.S. troops. This is an occupation. We can't do that. It's only the popular movements that can start the initiative for those kinds of, for those kinds of changes in Haiti. And finally, I just want to make the point that the popular movements in Haiti, people like those of the MPP, they know what they're up against. They see what they're facing. They share the experience of people in so many other countries, people like, say, those of the GAM, the relatives of the disappeared in, uh, in Guatemala, or people like the East Timorese, occupied by the Indonesian armed forces with the backing of the U.S. government. They know the price they pay. They know the risk they run if they decide to stand up and speak and demand their rights politically. In Haiti, it's frap terror. In East Timor, it's the kind of reception that those who marched to the Santa Cruz Cemetery on the morning of November 12, 1991 received. They were walking across town in protest. They were commemorating the death of a young man who had been murdered by the army when they stormed a Catholic church 10 days before. They were holding up banners calling for the U.S.-backed Indonesian troops to honor the UN Security Council resolutions and get out of their country. And as they stood outside the cemetery while some were laying flowers on the graves, the Indonesian soldiers marched up in formation. Amy and I were there. We went and stood between the soldiers and the Timorese. We thought a foreign presence would deter them. It didn't. They swept right past us. They raised their rifles to their shoulders all at once. They opened fire. They slaughtered that crowd of people. They killed, I don't know exactly how many people are here today, but they killed perhaps as many people as are here in this audience today, blowing them away right before our eyes with American M16s. We actually saw the pieces of flesh leaving their bodies, flying into the air, the kind of scenes of which we're now seeing the aftermath in Oklahoma City. We saw the re results of those explosions of munitions. We saw what those policy decisions uh, result in. In Guatemala, it's a similar story, just a, a different method. There you have the clandestine abduction in the middle of the night. People brought away to torture chambers where they cut off their digits one by one, their bodies displayed in public or their bodies dumped in mass common graves that are only disinterred a few years later. It's a worldwide policy, systematic, one country after another. And in Haiti, even though Aristide is back, even though it's called democracy on paper, people are still looking into the barrel of that gun. A member of the MPP was assassinated not long ago. Not long ago, U.S. Special Forces troops came into the headquarters of the MPP and, as Siobhan could tell you, uh, made threats and reminded them, as if they needed to be reminded, that the U.S. had the firepower to level that headquarters at any moment if they chose to do so. 
people in this country really have to understand something. They really have to start to think about the consequences of what happens when the U.S. government acts in this way overseas. It's people overseas who are living with this kind of terror. And I think it's only when we start to think about it in a different way that there'll be any chance of changing it. I think first we've got to stop dignifying these actions, these decisions with the mantle of policy. It's not policy, it's crime. And it's actually illegal. And it's actually illegal under international law. You have a whole set of principles, things like the Nuremberg principles, which say that mass killing, torture, political rape, and so on, these are crimes for which people can be prosecuted. You know, President Bush a few years ago said that Saddam Hussein should be put on trial for crimes against humanity for what he'd done in Iraq and Kuwait. I think that's a good idea. But if you're going to talk about that, if you're going to be serious about it and not use it as a political gimmick, you have to be willing to apply that across the board. You have to be willing to say, okay, we'll look at Iraq, we'll look at Kuwait, but this, let's also look at El Salvador. Let's also look at Guatemala. Let's also look at East Timor. Let's also look at Haiti. And when you start to look at those things, you're looking not just at crimes, but also criminals. You're looking at Colonel Collins and Emmanuel Constant. You're looking at Donald Terry, the CIA station chief, uh, running the sin from behind the scenes. You're looking at the U.S. officials on up the line uh, through the, uh, uh, the Reagan and Bush and Clinton administrations on up the line to the very top. You've got to be serious about calling people to account. Recently, I had a chance to put this idea to Elliot Abrams on the... Uh, <laughs> on, the on the Charlie Rose show discussing Guatemala, I suggested to Abrams that he should be tried by a Nuremberg-style tribunal for crimes against humanity. <laughs> but I agreed with a point that he always makes, and, and he's correct about this, that he was not acting as a renegade. He was not acting out of control. He had the support of the full administration for what he did in Central America, and he had the support of a majority of Democrats in Congress. Those policies in Nicaragua, Salvador, Guatemala, uh, those were ratified on a broad level by Congress, and that there should be Democrats there in the dock uh, with him, uh, next to him. Um, if you look at Haiti, they're talking about Aristide, some people in Haiti are trying to talk about justice now. The assassination of Ismeri, the assassination of, of, of Father Vincent, the attack on St. Jean Bosco Church, the torching of Cité Soleil, the hacking off of the arm of Mrs. Alert Balance by the frap. Imagine if you had a process of justice that did not stop with the Frank Romans and the Emmanuel Constance and the Francoise and the Cedruses, but also went up another notch to their employers, the policymakers in Washington who sent down the money, who set this on its course, only then would, would, would you start to come face to face with political reality. Only then would you start to see what we're really talking about here. You know, when a bunch of people get together and say, uh, let's knock over the corner drugstore, and they go and do it, and in the course of it, they shoot the clerk and a couple of customers. You don't say, they made a policy decision. <laughs> they made a policy decision to hit the drugstore. No, you say, they, committed a, they planned a crime, they committed a crime, they should be brought to justice and punished. And the sooner we realize that much of American governance involves these kinds of actions, the closer we'll be to dealing with reality. There's another point, though, another angle that I think is important to realize. Because, you know, people often say, when you have discussions like this, God, it's so depressing. 
to hear all this. You know, it's so discouraging. It's so shocking and disheartening. And it really is. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it in a certain sense. I mean, this kind of horror. I mean, these are the, the worst things in life. These are the worst things that humanity has to offer. And it's even worse when you start to realize that they're not the result of the actions of, of nuts uh, or of aberrations, but rather the results of deliberate decisions taken by the people who happen to be running your very own government. That's even worse. But it shouldn't get you down. Instead, it should get you up. It should get you rising to your feet in rage and in anger and in determination to stop it. Because if you don't stop it, if the people in this country uh, don't stop it, it won't get stopped. The people in Haiti are doing all they can. Siobhan's people come out onto the streets. They organize. They risk their lives going up against the Makuts. The people in East Timor walk to that cemetery, stand face to face with those American M16s, take the American supplied bullets in their faces. The people in Guatemala hold their union meetings, hear a knock on the door and are never seen again. They're doing everything they can. But they can't demonstrate on the streets of the United States. They can't vote in American elections. They can't lobby the Congress of the United States. They can't disrupt the operations of an American state which is exporting this kind of terror systematically to country after country. Only people here, uh, only people here can do that. And there's a key thing to remember just in terms of the practical politics of this. I happen to think that this whole American system of worldwide repression is in a sense very vulnerable politically for this reason. Because so much of it is done in effective secrecy. So much of it is done beneath the consciousness of the majority of the American uh, public. Most of the American public is not aware of this kind of systematic terror being perpetrated in Haiti, in Guatemala, in Salvador, in Timor. That creates an unstable situation for the state. You have diff it's, it's different, say, for example, slavery was a very different situation. In the case of slavery, the white population knew exactly what was going on they acquiesced in it, they supported it. There were no surprises. That was a stable form of repression. In this case, I really believe that the more that the facts leak out about what the U.S. is doing overseas, the more and more vulnerable the government uh, becomes. And it's why you see such panic at moments like uh, toward the end of Vietnam when this kind of thing was coming out onto the table or you see such efforts to, uh, to shut down the, uh, uh, the exposés that were uh, coming on Guatemala in the past few weeks, to contend that these are just rogue operations, a few, few people out of control. Because on an underlying basis, I'm convinced that if the U.S. population knew about this, they wouldn't stand for it and the terror wouldn't, uh, wouldn't continue. And finally, when you hear Siobhan uh, later, I'd suggest that Americans listen kind of on two tracks. On one track, listening in terms of thinking about, well, what can we do to help? What can people in this country do to try to stop the U.S. support for the elites and the killers in Haiti and directly support groups like the MPP? And on the other track, listen to think about, well, how can we learn from this great success, the way the MPP has under the Duvaliers and under the uh, uh, Cedrus and the Frap been able to organize and sustain themselves and keep going in the face of this terror. Because we need something very much like an American popular movement to mirror the Haitian popular movement. It's a very different country, very different society, very different problems. But we have a lot to learn from what they've been able to accomplish there. And Siobhan is a very good person to impart those lessons. So I'll just leave it at that and try to remind you that we're linked to what's happening in Haiti, whether we like it or not. It's not something that can be ignored. The blood that shed in Haiti, it's blood that, was it's blood that is shed as a result of decisions taken here. And we're the ones who are capable of stopping that.
but only if we stand up and do something about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan Nairn. In just a few minutes, we're going to be hearing from MPP peasant leader Siobhan Jean-Baptiste, followed by world-renowned political analyst and scholar Noam Chomsky. But right now, we thought we'd take you down to Haiti right now through Crowing Rooster Productions. This is a work in progress. During the years of the baby doc Duvalier regime, Siobhan risked the wrath of the Duvalier dictatorship as he trained hundreds of peasants and organi as organizers, teachers, and development workers. In 1987, after the ouster of the Duvaliers, the first National Peasant Groups Congress was held in Papai. A year later, the first MPP Women's Congress was held. Soon, by December 1990, by the time of the elections of Aristide, there were more than 35,000 members of the MPP, and they were seminal in the organizing and the work that elected Jean-Bertrand Aristide, president of Haiti. After the coup, soldiers based in Hanch attacked the MPP's work sites and unleashed a wave of terror aimed at breaking the back of the organization. They arrested and beat and killed MPP members, destroyed the organization's property, as you could see on this videotape. Siobhan Jean-Baptiste has long been a close friend of Aristide, and he became a key advisor to the president during the coup period while Aristide was here, projecting the voice of the popular movement on his presidential commission and later in his private cabinet. He was forced to remain in exile here, but in his time here during the coup, uh, he organized, did solidarity work here, educated Americans about the popular voice in Haiti. The MPP has been the recipient of the 40th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights Award given by the French government and the Alan Sean Feinstein Award for the Prevention and Reduction of World Hunger given by Brown University. I now present to you MPP leader Siobhan Jean-Baptiste. Nanon paysan haïtien yo, nanon peuple haïtien, moi salue nous et la va la suivant. In the name of the Haitian peasants and in the name of the Haitian people, I salute you in the la manner. Moi vle commencer par remercier nous tous qui présents dans la salle sa soya en solidarité avec peuple haïtien. I want to begin by thanking all of you who are present with us this afternoon that which are here in solidarity with the Haitian people. Euh solidarité ça journée jodi a li a manifesté après coup d'état 30 septembre là nous connaît qui d'égalité fait dans pays d'Haïti. This solidarity that we see here today has been growing since the 1991 coup d'etat, which exacted many uh, losses in, the ha in Haiti, which we well know. Et pour nous capable de comprendre pour qui ça aujourd'hui a bon présence militaire dans le pays d'Haïti, il est nécessaire pour nous comprendre pour qui ça a été un coup d'etat 30 septembre. In order to understand today why there was a presence of U.S troops in Haiti, we have to understand first why there was a coup d'état. Uh, coup d'état 30 septembre, c'est un coup d'état qui était fait justement 
parce que dans la politique États-Unis, la question de la participation du peuple dans les affaires politiques, c'est un bagage qui pas d'accord. The coup d'état was carried out because, frankly, with regards to U.S. policy, the question of popular participation in determining the affairs of a country is something that they do not look upon favorably. Et ça, c'est pas seulement en Haïti. Euh, dès qu'il y a une élection, dans quel que soit le pays en Amérique latine, c'est toujours une élection contrôlée, une élection manipulée. And throughout the hemisphere, when there are elections that are held, there are always elections that are controlled and manipulated. Euh, dans le pays d'Haïti, en 1990, tout le a été mis en place pour capable faire élection yo en faveur Magbazin. In 1990, the U.S. was doing everything possible so that the elections would bring to the presidency Mr. Marc Bazin. Cependant, en octobre 90, et bride sous coup, peuple a envahi scène politique là. However, in October 1990, all of a sudden, the Haitian people took to the political scene. Et ça bourrie quatre là. And that spoiled the plan. Et il était trop tard. It was too late for the U.S. to prevent Lavalas from coming down. Et c'est justement contre participation Lavalas qui voulait yon Haïti côté tout le monde veut la vie. Eh bien, yon dit ça son mauvais exemple dans le continent et coup d'état fait. And they acted precisely against that kind of participation which seeks a Haiti in which everyone is able to live a decent life. And this is the bad example that the U.S. was trying to prevent. C'est un mauvais exemple pour yon père, yon petit père, qui a prôné théologie libération vin président. And it was a bad example for some little priest, some advocate of uh, liberation theology, to become a president. C'est un mauvais exemple parce que si ça fait en Haïti, Yon joul ta kapab fèt tou au Brésil, yon joul ta kapab fèt au Mexique, sa dangere. And it was a bad example because if that could happen in Haiti, one day it could happen in Brazil. One day maybe it could happen in Mexico. Et si sa kapab se fèt tou pa tou, na Amérique Latine la, yon joul ba jem konen, la va la staka desan isi tou aux Etats Unis. And if that happened all throughout Latin America, you never know. One day it might even happen in the United States. C'est pour ça que je dis, les gens qui ont fait un coup de force militaire qui était débarqué le 19 septembre dans le pays d'Haïti, comme ils ont fait pour les pays haïtiens, nous-mêmes nous disons non. So that's why today, when things happen, for example, like the debarkment of the landing of U.S. troops in Haiti on the 19th of September, and they say that that's a favor they're doing to us, we say, we don't think so. Et ce n'est pas un favor. Et l'occupation du pays d'Haïti, il fait partie de la stratégie coup d'État. It's not a favor that they're doing us. In fact, the occupation falls within the same strategy of the coup d'État. Et si il y a une occupation, c'est justement parce que le coup d'État a été fait pour craser la participation du peuple, et bien après trois ans, frappe a frappé le peuple et frappe tout l'autre groupe paramilitaire yo eh bien peuple a continuer camper jam because if the coup was carried out in order to prevent the participation of the people they could see that even if frap was striking the people day after day frap and other groups repressive groups were striking the people in order to try and prevent their participation they could see that after 3 years it wasn't working the people were standing firmer than ever il y a pile manœuvre qui fait pour capable discréditer le président Aristide. Il y a même dit, c'est il y a même fait qu'on est les fous pour si le peuple a abandonné, et bien le peuple a continué à piller Titi Bired. They carried out all kinds of maneuvers in order to try and discredit President Aristide. For example, the CIA tried to say that he was crazy in order to, to uh, uh, see if the Haitian people would, uh, would abandon him. But the Haitian people stood beside him all the way. Et ça vient créer une situation, côté que 
coup d'état croqué dans gorge administration américaine. So what happened is that the coup d'état got stuck in the throats of the US administration. Et devant situation ça eh bien fait président ici de retourner dans pays à sans occupation eh bien c'est à et ou ta capable dire échec coup d'état and because of everything that had happened to return president aristide to the country without a us occupation you could say that that would be the checkmate for the coup d'état that would have blocked the coup donc force qui te fait coup d'état qui te lire le cédras michel françois ou bien bourgeoisie eh bien c'est instrument yoté and the forces that were behind the coup that supported it whether cédras or françois or the haitian bourgeoisie these were just tools that were being used la médaïti pas gagné aucune force sans pentagone c'est un simple peloton pentagone the haitian army has no force if it's not backed up by the pentagon it's only just a platoon of the us military donc et personne pas capable croire que c'est grâce avec un groupe militaire capable de résister contre volonté états-unis pour te faire démocratie tourner dans le pays d'haïti No one would believe it if you said that Cedras along with a small ragtag army would stand up to the will of the United States to return democracy to Haiti. Donc coup d'état c'est pas un coup d'état contre Cedras avec militaires ou contre frappe au contraire c'est un coup d'état pour protéger instrument qui te fait et disons et débarquement qui fait là c'est plutôt yon façon pour protéger instrument qui te fait coup d'état so that the arrival of us troops in haiti isn't something which is aimed at taking out the us military said ras francois and the tools that were used it's rather to protect those very instruments et te gagné en pile discussion en pile confusion et peuple a été tellement à souffrir il y a pile monde dans peuple haïtien haïtien qui a vécu ici aux états-unis qui te wè et débarquement ça et comme bon dieu qui t'a descend à le sauver peuple haïtien There was a lot of debate going on because there was so much suffering that the Haitian people were facing that there was a lot of debate going on and even within the Haitian community in the United States many people saw the arrival of US troops as though it was the uh, the second arrival of Christ Et dans pays a en pile moun t'a tann que les soldats américains ont débarqué ont après le craser ses draps, craser frappe, craser toute force qui était fait coup d'état. And people expected that when the US went into Haiti they were going to take out Cédras Francois and dismantle all of the repressive forces. Mais au lieu que se craser, ils ont vienne craser yo, c'est protection ils ont vienne ba yo. But instead of coming to crush them what they've come is to give them protection. Et c'est en bas protection et forçaio c'est grâce à le joui millions et millions de dollars ils te volaient dans caisse l'État l'argent ils te faisaient dans drogue et la trier. And it's with their protection that Cedras has gone off happily to enjoy the millions and millions of dollars that he stole from the Haitian people from the Haitian treasury and they, that he made off activities such as drug running. Euh, Peuple là, tu pensais que frappe qui c'était une création CIA, mais quand même, je t'apprends à craser frappe, et bien c'est en bas protection force à yo, n'est que Emmanuel Constant a bâillé une conférence de presse. And people thought, even though frappe is actually creation of the CIA, people got it into their heads that perhaps they would come to crush frappe, but Emmanuel Constant, when he gave his press conference, it was with US security that he did it. Donc, objectif. Et en plus le monde parle, il y aurait les sa occupation et il dit c'est un appui à la démocratie, c'est force multinationale. Bon, quand nous relais, il y a un chat, il y a un chat. Haïti il y a un bas occupation aujourd'hui. And many people even have trouble with the word occupation. They say, well, it's some kind of support that's being given, 
uh, for democracy in Haiti or its multinational forces, peacekeeping forces, but we have to call a spade a spade or a cat a cat. What it is is an occupation. Occupation, ça a deux objectifs fondamentaux. And this occupation has two fundamental objectives. Yon, c'est réaliser objectif coup d'état qui c'est éliminer masse populaire sous scène politique là. One of them is to carry out the objective or to realize the objective of the coup itself, which is to eliminate popular participation in the political agenda, in the political arena. Deuxième objectif fondamental là, c'est implanter projet économique néolibéral là dans le pays d'Haïti. And the second objective is to put firmly in place a neoliberal economic model in Haiti. Et ça, Objectif, ça, est fondamental pour l'occupation. And that's a very fundamental uh, goal of the occupation. Et pour deux objectifs, ça, je vous dis, c'est tout poids communauté internationale la mettre dans balance. And to gain these, uh, these objectives today, to realize them, the whole of the international community has put its shoulder to the yoke. Non. Si moi ça y est passé là, principal aide communauté internationale la baille à le joindre de groupe qui a travaillé, nous t'as dit contre gouvernement Aristide. And in the past six months, the aid which has come from the international community into Haiti has gone to support groups which are in opposition to President Aristide. Et par exemple, il y a une organisation qui est l'OIM, Organisation Internationale Migration, et qui a travaillé, qui a dépensé un pile million, on parlait de 60 millions, pour chercher à créer une base sociale pour l'opposition. Et vous avez des organisations, par exemple, comme like l'IOM, International, o- International Office of Migration, qui reçoit des millions de dollars de l'AID, ils parlent de potentiellement même 60 millions de dollars from AID in order to carry out a plan which will build the social base for the opposition in Haiti. Et pratiquement tout l'argent USAID allé dans même sens là pour aller soutenir groupe qui cherche créer base sociale pour faire une force contre la valasse. And practically all the AID money flowing into Haiti today is going to groups aimed at doing the same thing to create a social base which can counterbalance the Lavalasse movement. Par contre il y a un pile promesse, un pile million, même milliards que vous prenez le gouvernement ici, là, mais jusqu'à ce qu'on y a, et ce n'est pas qu'on goûte et ça a privé. And it's interesting to note that even despite all the millions and millions and even billions they've been promising the RSD government, the money is coming drop by drop. Et ça entraîne une stratégie parce que et aide là pral vini ou bien pas vini selon jan eleksyon yo pral pase. And that's a part of a strategy because is the money coming is it not coming well it all depends on what's going to happen in the upcoming elections. Donc tout aide économique lan li conditionné par question la valas la ki doue Bon, si c'est pas disparaître, mais au moins contrebalancer sous cette politique là et implantation projet néolibéral. So all of this money is conditioned on two factors. Either if it's not the the disappearance of the Lavalasse movement, then it at least needs to be counterbalanced with another force and also there needs to be implanted in Haiti a neoliberal economic model. Et là n'a parlé de économie Politique néolibérale, là, par exemple, c'est rivé privatiser toute entreprise de l'État dans le pays d'Haïti. Et quand nous parlons du néolibéral modèle en Haïti, ce qu'ils parlent, par exemple, c'est la privatisation de privatisation de toutes les entreprises de l'État. Par exemple, si nous prenons une entreprise de coût téléco, eh bien, c'est un bagage qui rapporte au pays à environ 50-60 millions de dollars par année. And if we take, for example, Teleco, the telephone company, this enterprise, which is owned by the state, brings in profits of 50 to 60 million dollars a year into the state coffers. Et 
ça c'est malgré tout le vol qui vient la donne. S'il t'a bien organisé, il a rapporté presque 100 millions de dollars. And that's given all of the uh, corruption that's happening within it. If it were cleaned up and uh, correctly managed, it could bring 100 million. Et l'argent ça, c'est l'argent qui t'a capable de servir pour créer l'école parce que j'y joue n'est jeudi à des plus passer un million de monde dans le pays d'Haïti qui pas aller l'école. And that money could be used, for example, to build schools, because today there are about a million children which have no access to schooling. Gagnant euh, 75% de la population qui est analphabète, ça a créé un programme d'alphabétisation. And with an illiteracy rate of 75%, this money could go toward a literacy campaign. Et plan, c'est un plan pour vendre toute entreprise, tout coup téléco, EDH. Douane, aéroport, etc. Et by secteur privé. The plan is to sell off all these state enterprises, the telephone company, the electricity company, even the customs and the airport, in order to sell them to the private sector. Et dans un pays, dans le pays, eh bien, l'État a besoin de l'argent pour mettre en place une série de structures sociales que c'est celle l'État qui est capable de faire. Il ne va exister. But in Haiti, the state needs these monies in order to put in place social infrastructures that have yet to be built in Haiti. Donc, plan, c'est faire Haiti tourner un vaste marché pour produits américains, de telle sorte que nous-mêmes nous pas besoin produit manger encore. États-Unis a voulu manger ben non. And the idea is to turn Haiti into a vast marketplace where, for example, we wouldn't need to produce our food anymore because the United States would just send it. Et nous même n'a pas seulement pour vendre force nous dans factory et Jean Peuple a dit pour pour patate. And we would be there just to sell our labor, to sell our sweat in factories for, as the Haitian people put it, potato skin. For just nothing. Et nous connais ces derniers bagages pour quitter sous compte moun se vend tout. Les vend tout sous compte moun, yo capable de faire ça yo vle avec, yo capable de mener au côté yo vle. And you know the last thing that you ever want to give anyone control over is your stomach, because when they control your stomach, they can pull you wherever they want. Donc pays d'Haïti où nous je dis à, il y a capacité. Pour les produits manger, pour nourrir 7 millions haïtiens et même exporter manger. But in reality, Haiti does have the capacity. It would have the capacity to feed its 7 million people and even to export food. Et je vous n'ai dit à, si nous prenons seulement du riz, nous importer du riz pour plus passer 70 millions de dollars par année, alors que nous gagnons tel pour produire. Du riz et pour nous exporter du riz. And today, for example, take the case of rice. We import over 70 million dollars worth of rice a year, but we have lands that can produce rice. We could produce that rice and even export it. Cependant, politique ça pas vle que Haïti produit manger, mais il vle Haïti seulement pour peuple travailler dans factory. But the kind of policies being implemented aren't in favor of Haitians producing that food. They want that food to be imported. Donc en bas situation ça journée aujourd'hui à pour comprendre tout ça qui a passé en Haïti. So what's underneath all of this? How can we understand what's happening in Haiti today? Euh six mois après le tout président Aristide, sept mois et après débarquement force multinationale là, eh bien nous ta capable dit situation peuple là il pas changé en pile ou bien il pas changé dans bon direction. Six months after the return of President Aristide to Haiti and seven months after the landing of the multinational forces, we can say that the situation of the Haitian people hasn't changed very much or at least that it hasn't gone in a positive trend. Euh yon na bagay que peuple a tapton et de force multinationale là c'est des armements ma couture one of the people one of the things that the people were expecting from the multinational forces was the disarmament of the macoutes euh 
Cependant, nous sommes capables de constater que des armements, ça, c'est un similac de des armements qui fait. Mais, ma, force ma couture, toujours un gros armement en bas de main. Yo. But what we've seen is that there's been some sort of a show, a window dressing of disarmament, but that the Makoud forces still have lots of weapons in their possession. Et à cause toutes les armes qui encore dans même Makoud, yo, et climat insécurité, il servi comme une arme et pour balancer gouvernement la valasse là. And because of the weapons which remain in the hands of the Makuts, There's a, there's a repression that is used, an insecurity which is used... Uh, non, c'est que, et à cause de l'amour, l'insécurité a servi pour balancer... It is pouvoir. used as, as, as a weapon in order to counterbalance the power of Lavalas. Et, et ou capable de considérer répression hein, ou bien insécurité a, comme il y a un bail qui a une commande, qui a un centre de commande, Là, il voulait le monter, le monter. Là, il voulait le baisser, le baisser. And you can see that this repression and this insecurity, it's like it has a command and control center. When they want it to go up, it goes up. When they want to bring it down a little bit, they bring it down. Et, par exemple, dans le dernier temps, il a monté. For example, in the last period of time, it's been going up. Même Jean, il était monté en septembre 1993. Le gouvernement Malvala te prend pouvoir. The same way that they raised it in September 93 under the Malval government. Donc, je vous n'ai dit à monter l'insécurité à tout cadavre qui gagne dans le pays à Najoussayo, marré avec question élection au Cap Vinila. And with this rising repression, we can see that all of the corpses appearing in the streets today are connected with this electoral process that we're in right now. Parce que il faut que yo crée un climat de peur la kay peuple là pour yon façon ou l'autre pour ne pas participer dans l'élection yo. Because what they're trying to do is put fear into the hearts of the people so that they don't go out to participate in elections. Donc en plus de situation insécurité ça que peuple là te comprendre qui t'a prêt à le baisser, ou gagner, ça crée une situation, la vie chère, une situation grand goût qui a crasé le peuple. And uh, in addition to this question of disarmament that people were expecting, which hasn't been carried out, there's also the very high cost of living, which the Haitian people are suffering from, and the widespread hunger, which continues. Yon n'a gros revendication peuple là, c'est justice avec réparation. Eh bien, je vous ai dit, on est de dire, machine, la justice, là, est bloquée. And one of the biggest demands of the Haitian people is justice and reparations. And today, you can say that the justice system is blocked. Et je vous ai dit, je vous ai dit, pour yon moun, pour Mireille Duroche Bertin. They're only trying to put justice in, in process for one person, Mireille Duroche Bertin. Parce que c'était un supporter coup d'État. Mais toute l'autre militant militants qui tombaient, ça n'a pas vaut rien. Mais tous les autres activistes qui ont fait, ils ne sont pas worth anything. Donc, et peuple a continué à demander justice, la continué à demander réparation, et pour toute victime coup d'État. Nevertheless, the people continue to demand justice and reparations for all of the victims of the coup. Euh, depuis le retour président ici, le peuple a demandé de nettoyage dans l'administration de l'État pour mettre ma couture de yon. J'ai joué aujourd'hui, la machine n'a pas tellement bougé non plus. Et depuis le retour du président Aristide, les gens ont demandé un général clean-up de la civil administration, des the, the employés de l'État, qu'ils devraient prendre tous les coups de supporters. Mais ce n'est pas encore gone forward. Donc, vous avez un gouvernement qui est un gouvernement soi-disant de réconciliation et côté où on toute qualité mounadal, même moun qui te n'a pas un jour. Because you have this government of reconciliation, which has all kinds of people inside it, even people that supported the coup. Donc, qu'on soit un gouvernement qui a dit qu'il n'y a ni volonté, ni capacité pour bailler et revendication peuple à satisfaction. So what you have is a government that has neither the will nor the ability to satisfy the demands of the people. 
Je vous la fièvre électorale là, la montée. Today, the fever associated with the elections is getting hotter. Et élection ça yo, yo gagne une importance capitale parce que yo capable servir pour faire coup d'état après un racine ou bien créer un espace démocratique pour et pour et projet société peuple capable avancer. And these elections are especially important because they can either be used to cement the coup or to make sure that the people's project is what is uh, favored. Et si peuple là rive participer sans qu'elle saute dans l'élection, la valasse là pral descendre. If the people without fear are able to participate in the elections, this avalanche, this lava loss will come down. Et comme en pile moun pa ta vle bon classe dominante là impérialiste là pa ta vle que la valasse la descende, il y a un pile risque que élection ça a fini dans sans peuple. But because the dominant forces within Haiti and the imperialists wouldn't like to see that happen, it's possible that there could be an upcoming bloodbath. Et et l'aime dit classe dominante là pas seulement même classe politique là parce que classe politique là pendant trois ans et coup d'état majorité classe ça t'es appuyé coup d'état y a pas aucune chance pour peuple à choisir moun n'a aucun parti politique qui t'es appuyé coup d'état. And when I say the dominant classes, I I should expand it to say the political classes because all of these politicians supported the coup in the last period of time and they know that if the people go to the polls that they're not going to be elected there's no chance of it. Et je dis c'est pour ça il va pas accuser et conseil électoral là il va et accuser organisation la valasse pour dire ah c'est élection officielle qui va le faire en faveur yon secteur mais pourtant c'est parce que yo même yo pas aucune chance puis yo capable gagner personne qui passer dans élection ça yo. And this is why today they're attacking the elect electoral council and they're saying that the lava loss organization is controlling these that the elections are being carried out only in their favor but it's they're crying like this because they know that there's no chance that they have to win even one seat in the upcoming election. Donc c'est pour ça journée jodi a li extrêmement important pour peuple là masse paysan yo masse populaire yo continuer résister continuer organiser yo And this is why it's especially important for the people, for the popular masses today, to continue to organize, to continue to resist. Et résistance là, c'est une résistance qui doit continuer contre coup d'état, parce que coup d'état pour qu'on finisse. And this is a resistance which should be carried out against the coup d'état, because the coup d'état has yet to be reversed. Et tout le monde, spécialement dans le peuple américain, dans la communauté internationale là, qui t'a soutenu peuple haïtien contre coup d'état et bien faut que on ait doit continuer supporter lutte peuple là And all the people that were supporting the Haitians in their struggle against the coup especially those in the United States need to understand if they were struggling against the coup they need to continue to struggle Et coup d'état li présent et nan jou k'ap vini la yo situation li capable vin et puis chaud dans pays là et c'est pour ça nous-mêmes nous pensons que ça qui est plus important journée aujourd'hui là c'est aider organisation peuple là structurer tête yo gonfler force yo pour continuer résistance là and because the upcoming period is going to be so very hot we think it's especially important to aid the forces on the ground the popular organizations on the ground to structure themselves to organize their resistance et Jean, paysan yo dil, Jean yo chantel, nan dernier congrès nous sont organisés nan mois mars là, nous pas bay les gains parce que victoire finale là c'est pour peuple. As the Haitian peasants say and as we sang in our last congress, we're not giving up because the final victory is ours. Et pour peuple là capable de remporter victoire ça eh bien il compter sous solidarité nous tout qui là 
li compter sous solidarité tout le monde qui a plié pour une véritable démocratie, non seulement dans le pays d'Haïti, mais sur toute la terre. Merci à vous. And for us to have that final victory, we count on the support of all of you here and, for, and the support of all those that are supportive of democracy, real democracy, not only in Haiti, but throughout the world. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Noam Chomsky needs no introduction. good speech that she was planning to make, but you didn't let her get to it. Uh, well, just so that uh, no one's misled, I'm not going to talk about the announced title, uh, Eyewitness Report. I, I do have some vivid impressions, but there are other people here who know a lot more about it and can say much more and have said much more. Uh, so I'll keep the things that I uh, understand somewhat better. Uh, the, uh, can you hear me back there? No. Backgrounds in, uh, yeah, how's that? I'll keep to the uh, backgrounds in uh, U.S. policy uh, for what's going on uh, and uh, the framework for it. Uh, this, these are factors that have had a very significant role in Haiti's history for 200 years, uh, a, an overwhelming role in this century and an absolutely dominant uh, role today. Well, there's both a negative and a positive side to that. The negative side is the nature of the impact. The positive side is what Alan Nairn stressed so well, namely that we can change that course. Well, the history is in fact very revealing. As you know, there's a big debate going on now about whether we should study Western civilization. And I'm a reactionary on that one. I think we should. I think there's a lot to learn from studying Western civilization. Uh, and I want to uh, describe some of those things. Uh, we, should just, we can start uh, with the uh, barbarian invasion that uh, emanated from the Western fringe of uh, Europe, West and Northwest Europe, about 500 years ago, uh, swept over most of the world. Uh, devastated everything in its path. Uh, it was guided by what already over 200 years ago Adam Smith called uh, the savage injustice uh, of the uh, Europeans. Uh, one of the earliest victims, uh, the earliest victim, in fact, was uh, Haiti, uh, much like uh, Bengal, another early victim. Uh, both of these were uh, regarded with awe by the conquerors as paradises, uh, densely populated, rich, uh, peaceful. In the case of Bengal, in fact, very highly industrialized, developed by the standards of the time. The conqueror, Robert Clive, uh, compared its capital city uh, to uh, London. Uh, the capital city is Dhaka, that's now the capital of Bangladesh. Uh, it's a striking fact. Uh, which indeed generalizes very broadly that the two first paradises, uh, Haiti and what is now Bangladesh, uh, were, uh, are now the very symbols of uh, destruction and misery. Uh, that's something that we can learn something, uh, we can learn from if we want to understand the nature of Western civilization. Uh, right into the, through the 18th century, Haiti was the richest colony in the world. It was the source of uh, a large part of France's wealth, wealth of other imperial countries. Uh, early in this century, Americans still regarded Haiti as a, uh, a, a very rich material prize. Uh, in the 1970s, US aid was confidently turning it into uh, what they called the Taiwan of the uh, Caribbean. Uh, the uh, 
uh, the, uh, there was, as you know, 200 years ago, about 200 years ago, uh, a rebellion, a slave rebellion, which overthrew French rule, overthrew colonial rule. That terrified Western civilization. It terrified the civilized world uh, because it appeared that this would put a, uh, uh, would impose barriers to the savage injustice of the Europeans. And the reason was pretty simple. It was described not long ago by one of the leading Haitian historians, Patrick Bellegarde Smith, who pointed out that Haiti was the first nation in the world to argue the cause of universal freedom for all humankind, revealing the limited definition of freedom that was adopted by the French and American revolutions that had preceded it. Uh, Napoleon set forth uh, in his words, to annihilate the black government that had dared to, liber to liberate the country, uh, as he indeed proceeded to do with extraordinary, tried to do at least with extraordinary savagery. And he explained the reasons in terms which have a very contemporary ring, not much changes over the centuries. He said, I have been less guided by considerations of commerce and finance than by the necessity of stifling in every part of the world every kind of germ of disquiet and trouble. Uh, that's actually an early version of what's nowadays called the domino theory. Uh, nowadays, you don't talk about destroying the germs of every disquiet and trouble. Uh, modern terminology is uh, the kind favored by Dean Acheson or Henry Kissinger. Uh, is that you have to watch out for those rotten apples that might spoil the barrel or viruses that might infect others. Uh, but the fear is the same. Uh, it is the fear of what Oxfam once called the threat of a good example, uh, the fear of the demonstration effect of freedom and independent development, which Napoleon understand, understood very well. And he went on to say that the specter of the new world uh, would sooner or later fall into the hands of blacks unless he succeeded in destroying this germ of freedom. Well, blacks here is to be understood in a pretty broad sense. It means anybody who's not white. Uh, it's to be understood in the same sense as the was used by the uh, distinguished British statesman Lloyd George about 60 years ago when he was explaining why Britain could not accept disarmament treaties because, as he put it, uh, with the proper elegance of the upper classes, uh, we have to reserve the right to bomb the niggers. Uh, and the niggers that he had in mind at that point were mostly Kurds and Iranians and uh, Arabs in the Middle East and North Africa. In fact, pretty much the same niggers that we feel the right to bomb today anytime it uh, uh, meets, satisfies our fancy. So again, not much has changed. Uh, the leading French diplomat of the day, uh, Talleyrand, uh, he wrote a letter to, uh, uh, incidentally, one of Kissinger's most admired models. Uh, he wrote to James Madison in 1805 that the existence of a Negro people in arms uh, occupying a country it has soiled by the most criminal acts is a horrible spectacle for all white nations. And it was hardly necessary for him to emphasize that fact to the leader of one of those white nations uh, that was then just uh, undertaking its own industrial revolution, uh, basing itself primarily, apart from high protective tariffs, on, uh, the, uh, exist on, the, on, the, on the fact it was able to uh, keep the major commodity of the day, cotton, very cheap uh, through the process of exterminating the indigenous population and bringing in slaves from Africa uh, and then shortly after robbing a third of Mexico. Uh, the, uh, uh, it was also about at that time about to in, uh, enter into its, the first executive war, the kind of executive war that's become the norm in the mid and late 20th century, uh, the, uh, a war that was undertaken uh, in self-defense, as of course all wars are in self-defense against uh, uh, hordes of uh, lawless Indians and runaway Negroes in Florida uh, as uh, 
John Quincy Adams wrote while defending this act of self-defense, conquest of Florida, uh, again, uh, defending it in uh, a quite astonishing racist diatribe full of outlandish lies, which to this day is regarded as one of the outstanding state papers in American diplomacy, and which we would all be reading if we were to study Western civilization. Uh, the uh, slave revolt had a tremendous impact on American history, enormous one in fact. Uh, it led, the success of the slave revolt led France to relinquish its interest in the Louisiana Territory, which opened the way for the United States to uh, take over uh, a huge part of the continent. Uh, that was indeed well understood in the, at the time. Uh, in his classic uh, history of the Jeffersonian America, about 100 years ago, uh, Henry Adams pointed out that the prejudice of race alone blinded the American people to the debt they owed, to the desperate courage of half a million Haitian Negroes who would not be enslaved. Well, that debt was indeed paid, although in a somewhat different fashion. Uh, the, Haiti was devastated by the uh, war that was undertaken to stop the germ from spreading, something that we have many examples of in modern times, I should say, one being discussed on the front pages right now, Indochina fought for the same reasons and with much the same consequences. Uh, Haiti was forced to, uh, uh, to uh, it was punished for the crime of liberation from France uh, by huge indemnities that it had to pay to France, France being the injured party by the standards of Western civilization. Uh, it was also uh, punished by a very harsh embargo, the most relentless torturer being the slave society right next door, not very surprisingly. Uh, the United States was the last major country to even recognize Haiti. That was in 1862 in the context of the Civil War, uh, and the same year, incidentally, uh, uh, the Lincoln government recognized Liberia, uh, and it was pretty much for the same reasons they recognized that they were going to have a lot of these uh, blacks around with nothing much to do with, and they were hoping to export them uh, so that the country could be uh, free of blot or mixture, as Thomas Jefferson put it, uh, when he was looking forward to the day when it could be a country without uh, niggers around, the niggers being uh, black and red in those, in, the, in, in those days. Well, the torture continued through the late 19th century, right into this century, reached its peak with the invasion of Haiti by Woodrow Wilson. Uh, that's one of the actions which are, we have a technical term for them. They're known as Wilsonian idealism in Western civilization. Uh, this particular act of Wilsonian idealism killed thousands of people, about 15,000, according to the leading Haitian historian of it, uh, reinstituted slavery, uh, dismantled the parliamentary system, uh, uh, turned the country into a plantation, an American plantation, and most crucially of all, uh, instituted an army uh, which had the task of uh, destroying uh, any uh, germ of uh, freedom, as uh, Napoleon would have put it, and has been doing that so ever since. It was going to stifle every kind of germ of disquiet and trouble. It was designed for that purpose, has been intent on achieving it with the aid of the founders. Uh, exactly the same thing happened in the Dominican Republic at the same time, right next door, also an exercise of Wilsonian idealism, which turned out about the same way, uh, it was marginally less awful uh, because the prejudice of race was less extreme uh, in this case. That is, the dagos and the spics, as the Wilson administration called them, uh, were a little less disgusting than the niggers next door, so therefore they got off a little, little bit easier, though not much. Uh, well, there are good, and it's also stayed that way under the rule of the same, of a National Guard established at the same time for the same purposes. Uh, I should just mention that there are pretty good reasons why American history is never taught. Uh, one can learn far too much from it. 
and the lessons are much too dangerous uh, for the rabble to understand, uh, especially uh, because they apply so well to the present day. There's nothing I said that with a few changes of words doesn't apply to everything going on now, and recall this is hundreds of years ago. Well, let's continue to break the rules and look at what came next. Uh, what came next was World War II, which led to a big change in world affairs. Uh, the U.S. came out of World War II, the world dominant power, of course, uh, and very self-consciously set about organizing the world, uh, and in particular, the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the United States was finally able, after World War II, to realize the goals of the Monroe Doctrine, that is, to drive out of the hemisphere its primary enemies, uh, Britain and France, and to take it over for itself, uh, and it indeed proceeded directly to do that in quite important and interesting ways. Uh, by now, the niggers extended from the Rio Grande and the Caribbean all the way down to uh, Argentina and Chile, and throughout that whole large region, uh, most of them felt the lash uh, um, bitterly in the next half century, another chapter in Western civilization. Well, in February 1945, these plans were, right as the war was coming to an end, the plans were being laid. There was a major hemispheric conference in Chapultepec, Mexico, uh, and at that conference, there was what's uh, called a clash of civilizations, uh, to borrow the rhetoric of the uh, professor of science of government, as they call it, at Harvard. He's talking about the clash that we're now facing. But there was a big clash of civilizations right then, uh, which had to do with the fate of the hemisphere. On the one hand was Western civilization, represented by us, of course. On the other, half, what, on the other hand was Latin America, uh, and here I'll just borrow the terminology of the State Department at the time, since they said it well enough. Uh, Latin America was guided by what the State Department called the philosophy of the new nationalism. Uh, it was swept by a kind of a disease which was calling for broader distribution of wealth and raising the standard of living of the masses. Uh, Latin America, I'm continuing to quote, Latin Americans are convinced that the first beneficiaries of a country's resources should be the people of that country. Well, that was the philosophy of the new nationalism, which naturally horrified uh, the leaders of the civilized world, uh, who, and the U.S. demanded something else, an economic charter for the Americas, as it was called, which would block what they called excessive industrial development and keep to what was called complementary development, meaning the kind of development that would be complementary to the needs of the masters of the U.S. economy. And it had to be understood that the first beneficiaries of a country's resources are definitely not the people of that country, but rather uh, U.S. investors. Well, civilization had the guns, uh, so the U.S. won that clash of civilizations. Uh, and the consequences are quite evident. Uh, the World Bank every year uh, uh, discusses with great distress the fact that Latin America has the worst record of inequality in the world, um, although I should say we're doing pretty well in that competition. Uh, New York City has just passed Guatemala uh, uh, with regard to inequality, although that I think is likely to be improved. Uh, there's a general belief that the current budget of the governor and the, uh, uh, and the mayor, uh, let alone what's going on in Congress, are going to increase the inequality of New York, and I suspect that that's wrong. I think it's going to improve the situation so that it's more equal because the poorer part of the population, meaning a very substantial part, will either just be killed or driven away. Uh, and at that point, the quality figures will improve, so it may not be as bad as Guatemala in a few years. Uh, in any event, uh, the, uh, uh, and that's the conscious and deliberate social policy. It's pretty obvious when you look at what's happening. Uh, the uh, uh, Western Hemisphere has the worst record, Latin America, the worst record of inequality in the world. It's a total disaster area for the vast majority. Uh, we're not supposed to understand the reasons for that. Uh, well, that's one of the defects of not studying Western civilization and American history. You don't see the reasons, which are pretty easy to discern. Uh, they start from 
the Chapultepec Conference and the victory of civilization in this class of civilizations. Uh, well, that was only part of it. The uh, Truman administration understood that the way to prevent the philosophy of the new nationalism from spreading, the way to prevent any threat of democracy, any shred of uh, any germ of disquiet and trouble in Napoleon's phrase, the way to do that is to make sure that the U.S. ran the security forces. It was a lesson that had already been understood from Haiti and the Dominican Republic and other places nearby, but now it had to be extended hemisphere-wide. So the U.S. took over control of the security forces. 1951, U.S. training uh, and arming of the security forces of the hemisphere took was initiated, and it was quite successful. Within three years, by 1954, 13 out of 20 countries uh, were under military dictatorships. Uh, now, this got a lot worse during the Kennedy years, which is the peak of terror and aggression in modern American history. Uh, in 1962, the Kennedy administration uh, reached a decision of extraordinary importance and one which would definitely be studied if American history were a subject that were permitted in the schools. Uh, the, uh, in 1962, the Kennedy administration shifted the mission of the Latin American military from hemispheric defense to internal security. Well, hemispheric defense was a kind of a residue from the Second World War, which was by then outdated. Uh, but internal security uh, was uh, something pretty serious. Internal security is a euphemism that means war against your own population, uh, the kind of war that, say, the Haitian and Dominican National Guard carry out. That's internal security. Uh, and that was uh, that mission, that decision was extremely important. Again, instead of my describing the consequences, let me describe them in the terms used 20 years later by the man who headed the uh, counterinsurgency for the Kennedy administration, Charles Machling. He says that that decision, that 1962 decision, led, uh, 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 caused a change from toleration of the rapacity and cruelty of the Latin American military to direct complicity uh, in uh, massacres and crimes of the kind carried out by Heinrich, Hitler's, Heinrich Himmler's extermination squads. So that's the change that took place in 1962, and the description is quite accurate. Uh, the first major beneficiary of the change was Brazil, where the Kennedy administration undermined and destroyed the parliamentary regime, which was having these germs of disquiet again, and instituted a, the rule of uh, neo-Nazi generals in what the Kennedy liberals called uh, the greatest victory for freedom in the mid-20th century. Uh, the author of those words then went on to become president of Johns Hopkins University, uh, the, uh, where I guess they still don't understand the study of American history, at least they didn't the last time I was there and went through this in more detail. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, Brazil's a big, powerful country, and of course that had a domino effect, uh, and pretty soon a plague of repression without any, uh, you know, no, no model in the whole bloody history. The hemisphere had spread all over the place. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the reasons were also understood and made clear. The Kennedy administration also greatly enhanced the training and arming of uh, the uh, Latin American military, as Alan Nairn showed years ago, that's the origins of the contemporary death squads. Uh, the uh, purpose was pretty clear. It was the same purpose that had al always been established. It was uh, made very explicit in National Security Council memoranda and other high-level reports, which fortunately we don't study not having a subject like American history. Uh, but they're public. So, for example, the one that was NSC 95432, which was reached right after the successful overthrow of Guatemalan democracy, uh, said, uh, made it explicit that the major threat facing the United States was the threat of uh, radical and nationalistic regimes, uh, which were uh, under pressure by the, major by the masses of the population for rapid improvement in low living standards and development for domestic needs. In other words, that disease of the philosophy of the new nationalism, and obviously we couldn't tolerate that because we represent civilization. Uh, so therefore, we had to increase the 
funding and organization of the security forces as the Kennedy administration did. Uh, they were the ultimate barrier, as always. Uh, uh, Robert McNamara, who's in the news these days, explained it to McGeorge Bundy, the National Security Advisor. Uh, he pointed out that in the Latin American uh, political cultural environment, these guys are intellectuals, remember, so they Harvard types, so they talk in big words. In the Latin American cultural environment, uh, the military has the responsibility of removing from power civilian governments when, in the judgment of the military, the, civilian, the acts of the civilian governments are injurious uh, to the welfare of the nation. He didn't say which nation he had in mind, but uh, <laughs> you can uh, guess that. Uh, and uh, he also explained that we can rely on the judgment of the military because the enhanced U.S. training that was initiated by the Kennedy administration had led them to an understanding of and orientation towards our objectives. Uh, so therefore, when they carried out these acts that are required in the Latin American cultural environment, they would do it the right way. Well, the U.S. is a global power, remember. Uh, so exactly the same thing was done worldwide. And in fact, at exactly the same time, uh, it was done in Indonesia, uh, where there was also the threat of a political party political party, that was, well, there was one mass political party, it was recognized to be without controversy, the party that was defending the interests of the poor. Uh, and that's another one of those, uh, you know, germs of disquiet. Uh, the U.S. was training the military and succeeded in 1965. In 1965, there was a military coup uh, which slaughtered, uh, which carried out what the New York Times described with enormous enthusiasm as a staggering mass slaughter. Uh, that uh, created a gleam of light in Asia, uh, as the Times headline put it, uh, namely wiped out the party that was uh, uh, that uh, defending the interests of the poor, uh, carried out a mass, huge mass murder, the biggest one since the Second World War. This was greeted with total euphoria in the United States, across the board. If you want a sample of it, I reviewed it in a recent book, but it's kind of embarrassing, so it's off the agenda. Uh, and the way in which people reacted to what, they, what Time magazine called the boiling bloodbath uh, was, uh, is not too well remembered, but it was true. And McNamara explained at that time to Johnson that uh, the United States had played a significant role in that by training military officers. It's good to bring them to places like Harvard and so on because they get the right orientation and therefore they're able to cleanse their society in the required way and to stifle shreds of uh, germs of disquiet and trouble. Uh, the support of the United States for the Indonesian slaughters in East Timor in part has a lot of reasons, but one reason is just gratitude uh, for this uh, achievement for which Indonesia won plenty of points, you can assume. Uh, well, everything else that happened is kind of deducible from that. There isn't even really much point going on in further details. Those are the basic outlines of policy. Uh, that's the basic, ver that's, those are the basic facts about Western civilization in our particular case. Of course, it's only one version of history, and it has only one merit, namely truth. Uh, so it's therefore under a total ban. Uh, but there's also another version of history which has a, another virtue, namely the virtue of being politically correct. Uh, so that one's very commonly heard, in fact, everywhere. Well, of course, this is a free society, so the politically correct version is not uniform. There's a spectrum. Uh, in fact, you're watching the spectrum unfold in the uh, great debate over McNamara's uh, book. Uh, there's a left and a right. Uh, on the left, you have the people who say that we made mistakes uh, in an excess of moralism and Wilsonian idealism and misunderstanding and ignorance. And then way over on the right, you have the people who say we made mistakes uh, because we're too humane and too sentimental and too cowardly. And within that spectrum, you're allowed to participate in the discussion. Uh, but to suggest there's, of course, another, in the case of Vietnam, there happens to be another logically possible position, uh, namely that it was not a mistake, rather fundamentally and morally wrong, uh, that position is actually held, believe it or not, by an exotic group of people outside of the educated sectors, 
namely 70% of the population, in Gallup polls from which I've just been quoting uh, ever since the question was asked in an open question starting in 1970. But there, you know, that's just what Alexander Hamilton once called the great beast, the people we, we have to cage. Uh, so naturally, they don't participate in this uh, debate between left and right. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the right wing is, uh, is uh, interestingly exhibited, uh, as is the left, incidentally, on the pages of the New York Times every day. A good example was just Friday. There's one I really urge you to read. There's a left and a right, you know, Anthony Lewis and A.M. Rosenthal, of course, talking about Oklahoma City. Uh, over on the right, uh, Rosenthal, former chief editor, so you learn a lot about what the Times is like by reading his columns. I'm kind of surprised that they let him write, actually. It gives an a tremendous insight into what was going on there for many years. Uh, anyway, what his column said that uh, he's the one, one, the one who said our problem is we make mistakes because of excessive humanity and cowardice. Uh, well, talking about Oklahoma City, he said, we don't yet know who was responsible, but we should bomb the bastards anyway. That's essentially what it came to. Uh, and the bastards are everyone in the Middle East, uh, with one notable exception. Uh, that is, we should bomb uh, the people, uh, Lloyd George's niggers. I mean, they're still there, and uh, we have to reserve the right to bomb them. And whether they were responsible or not, we don't know. He wasn't quite sure whether they were responsible, but you could just hear the, uh, you could hear him salivating with pleasure as he described this prospect. Uh, well, that's over on the right. On the left, uh, Anthony Lewis was saying that we have to uh, have reason and we have to wait until we find out that they're responsible before we bomb them. That was the hidden, <laughs> that was the hidden text. He didn't say those words, but we have to be reasonable. Uh, the uh, common description was also interesting, the standard description, the headlines, so on, is that Oklahoma City looks just like Beirut, and that's a real turning point in American history. And that's a fair description, but so far nobody's made the obvious comment. Uh, Beirut has looked like Beirut for a long time, uh, not just today. Uh, and since we love anniversaries so much, uh, one time when Beirut looked like Beirut was exactly 10 years ago, uh, in March 1985. Rather important year because 1985 was the peak year of Middle East terrorism. That was the year when editors all over the world picked Middle East terrorism as the biggest story of the year. And in fact, it was a pretty terrible year. And the worst atrocity uh, in Middle East terrorism, in fact, was the worst car bomb in history which blew up in uh, Beirut in March 1985. Uh, the, it, was, uh, it wasn't out of, outside a federal building, it was outside a mosque, uh, timed so as to kill the maximum number of people, namely when people were leaving the mosque. Uh, 80 people were killed, 256 injured, uh, babies in their beds, mostly women, uh, read the current newspapers and you know exactly what it looked like. Even the numbers seem to be about the same. Well, right now we're still not quite sure who to bomb, or at least we weren't on Friday. Uh, but in the case of the uh, Beirut bombing in 1985, there's no question about who to bomb. And the US Air Force certainly has the capacity to do it. Uh, the person primarily in charge, uh, unfortunately, he can't be bombed because he died a few years ago. Uh, but uh, CIA Director William Casey's uh, co-conspirators, uh, they're still around, living quite happily in uh, California and Texas and around here, I suppose, in New York. Uh, and since this was a CIA organized bombing, uh, we know exactly who to bomb for that one uh, when Beirut looked like Beirut. Uh, we might drop a couple of bombs on London, too, because British intelligence also seems to have been involved in this operation. Uh, well, going over to the voice of reason, since we don't want to follow the crazies. Uh, this is, sounds pretty reasonable to me. I mean, maybe there's an error in logic, but if so, I'm kind of missing it. Uh, so the voice of reason would suggest that uh, we, should, uh, 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 we should pursue the perpetrators to the ends of the earth, as the president said, and if we have to bomb the governments that were responsible or the places where they're hanging out, we know exactly how to do it, and nobody's stopping us. Well, let's return to Haiti and uh, politically correct history. 
Uh, let's begin with the, since I've been giving you this odd version, which is only true, uh, let's uh, begin with the higher reaches of scholarship. And we can begin right now. So take the current March 1995 issue of the newsletter of the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, which incidentally is the most open and honest and serious of the professional associations that I know of in the humanities and the social sciences. So I'm not going off into some, you know, it's not Abe Rosenfeld. Uh, this, uh, uh, the, March, the current issue ha features one scholarly article, as they usually do. This one's by Frederick Marx III, uh, and it is a scholarly critique of what he calls American parochialism. American parochialism is the failure of historians to understand other cultures, our naive belief uh, that those other cultures are sort of nice folk like us. And he says this leads us historians into all sorts of errors. Well, here's one of his prime examples. I'll quote, the reversion of Haiti to military rule after seven months under the renegade priest Aristide was seen by many in the North as an anomaly rather than as a statement about democracy. The reason being that we in this country have trouble imagining that there could be a deeply seated cultural longing for firm rule by a power elite or an elite of intelligence and training. Uh, so that's why we misunderstand what went on and we don't realize that the, contrary to what Sean was saying, that the mass of the people of Haiti were just pleading for the rule of a an elite of intelligence and training and a firm rule uh, after they had had to suffer under this renegade priest for seven months. Well, Napoleon couldn't have put it better, or maybe Stalin. Uh, and uh, since I have to admit I'm kind of uh, rendered speechless by this display of scholarship, I won't try to comment. Uh, so let's turn to some serious thinkers in the press instead on the occasion of the US intervention. Uh, there was historical, of course there was a lot of description, but there was also historical background provided, uh, both in the New York Times and the Washington Post, two leading newspapers. Uh, in the uh, New York Times, the historical background was presented by R.W. Apple, who wrote that for two centuries, political opponents in Haiti uh, um, routinely slaughtered each other. The backers of President Aristide, followers of General Cedras and the former Tonton Makout, retain their homicidal tendencies to say nothing of their weapons. Uh, he didn't add that the homicidal maniacs in the slums and the hills had cleverly concealed the weapons, uh, but anyway, they retain them. Uh, then he added more historical depth, which goes like this. Uh, like the French in the 19th century, and like the Marines who occupied Haiti from 1915 to 1934, the American forces who are trying to impose a new order will confront a complex and violent society with no history of democracy. Well, the fact that the vicious terror and racism of the Wilsonian idealists has been erased from history, that we're sort of familiar with. I mean, we know that. But Napoleon, you know, to describe Napoleon in these terms, that's an innovation. And I presume it's part of the general project of rewriting the entire history of the barbarian invasion uh, in preparation for the next phase. Well, that's the New York Times. Uh, let's go over to the Washington Post, where historical background was presented by their deep thinker, David Broder. Uh, he said that the American forces landing in Haiti were facing a real danger. He said, US troops may be caught in, an, in the ongoing civil war between heavily armed groups bent on revenge and determined not to yield power. So we stand sort of uneasily between these heavily armed gangs uh, like Napoleon's General Leclerc, who warned Napoleon that it would be necessary to murder every Negro for the forces of light to prevail. Or maybe like the Soviet troops who uh, occupied Prague and were caught between heavily armed gangs, you know, the Stalinist security forces on the one hand and the 
protesters on the other uh, and uh, were uh, in danger of being uh, uh, um, harmed by their homicidal tendencies or maybe to take another example the American troops who uh, liberated Buchenwald and faced the real danger that they were caught between uh, two uh, they were caught in an ongoing civil war between heavily armed gangs based on revenge with homicidal tendencies or pick other examples uh, that's the problem uh, he then went on to say that Clinton has followed, I'm quoting, Clinton has followed the idealistic President Woodrow Wilson in sending American forces to Haiti. Uh, we tried for 19 years to create a demo democratic society there and we failed. And now we're back again, uh, turning back to the New York Times, still aspiring to do good works, unable to comprehend the division in Haitian society between the rich and the poor. That's just something we just can't grasp. You know? <laughs> uh, the reason we can't grasp it is that we love the poor. It's called, in fact, tough love. There's even a name for it. That's the way you love the poor when you're grinding them down and, you know, in the Gingrich, Pataki, etc. style. But since that's our nature, uh, we just can't understand these divisions between uh, rich and poor and we're going to have so much trouble that we're still aspiring to do good works. Well, that's the kind of history we're to remember uh, and in fact to repeat and in fact to memorize and to speak on every occasion at least if you're properly educated. Uh, and there's also a properly, a, a politically correct version of the history of the recent past. So the New York Times again laments that uh, the renegade priest uh, was unable to guide the country's economy during the seven months that he was in office. Uh, he, uh, 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 he, uh, he, uh, the, uh, uh, they called upon for further comment uh, Pizzullo, who was Clinton's point man until he was forced out because he, had, he was getting a little embarrassing. He was lying too outrageously to Congress and they had to get rid of him. Uh, but he remained an expert for the New York Times, and he explains that Aristide failed politically while in office uh, because he was unwilling to broaden his political base, that is beyond the huge majority of the population, uh, to include uh, those, the elite of intelligence and training, uh, the, what are called in the, in the West the middle classes, which refers to 1% of the population, and he didn't broaden his base to them properly, uh, didn't have the right people in power. Uh, the, uh, uh, he, uh, the other problem he faced was his estrangement from the elected parliament coupled with his chilly relationship uh, with the uh, leading uh, element, with the uh, political and military leaders that led, to, that's what, what led to his overthrow. So obviously pretty bad character, but of course, what can you expect in a country with no democratic traditions? Uh, only a, a vibrant, lively civil society of grassroots movements that had uh, come out from nowhere and had offered the population a chance to participate in local affairs and even national affairs, as America's Watch put it, uh, something that caused outright horror here. Uh, the hatred for democracy in the United States among the educated classes is, uh, again, has to be watched to be believed. As for the elected parliament that uh, Aristide couldn't get along with, uh, they were elected, indeed, because the popular movements didn't have the resources uh, to challenge the traditional wealthy and military middle classes, that 1%, uh, so therefore they were indeed elected. Uh, and uh, now the, uh, the, pro the, the, what the president must do is to bring back the business and the military and put them in power uh, so that then civil society will be, uh, 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 will be back functioning in the proper way. Well, the crucial elements of this, these fairy tales are endlessly repeated and they're sort of interesting. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, economic failures of, uh, of the Aristide regime were in fact described in a secret 
February 1992 U.S. Embassy cable, which reported the leaked, but then suppressed, recorded the surprisingly successful efforts of the Aristide government, which were quick, quickly reversed by the coup. Uh, that, um, that was also, the same thing was reported by the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, as it described how Aristide's successes during the 17 months, in their words, were welcomed by the international financial community, which therefore gave him substantial assistance, further frightening Washington, incidentally, uh, but that's, of course, the wrong story, so that's not part of history. Uh, what is part of history is that once Aristide was brought to Washington, uh, he was civilized. He had been what was called a, 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 a demagogue, a, a rabble-rouser, a, a terrorist, a gangster, an ideologue. Uh, he had even tried to raise the minimum, minimum wage and interfered with market forces. Uh, but while in Washington, he got civilized. So as his strongest supporters put it, put it I'm not talking about his critics, but his strongest supporters, uh, he was given a crash course in democracy and capitalism. Uh, the uh, leading commentator in the New York Times, Elaine Shalino, uh, said that the Clinton administration really worked hard force-feeding him with a dose of economics and public administration. And the result of all of this was that he became pragmatic uh, uh, and uh, he learned about democracy and capitalism. Uh, democracy means you follow orders uh, while you have a nice smile and you shuffle around and you say, thank you, Massa, or something like that. And capitalism means about the same thing. Uh, and uh, the idea is, well, maybe he got civilized. That's the hope. There's a big headline in the New York Times, something that he may, there may have been a transition from a Robespierre who was only committed to terror to a Gandhi, kind of like us, you know, although we weren't quite sure that that would, was achieved. Well, that's, I'm not going to proceed with the official history. You've heard it and seen it plenty of times. It closely resembles Stalinist history. And that's the history that we're allowed to tell, in fact, urged to tell. But the real history is just kind of old hat and boring and the domain of ideologues and uh, certainly nothing that one would want to study in courses on Western civilization. Well, let's put the history aside and just go to the last few years. Uh, in the 1970s and the 80s, USAID was laboring to turn Haiti into the Taiwan of the Caribbean, as I mentioned and they poured in plenty of money, and they had a lot of successes. Uh, they created what is called in technical terms an economic miracle, like the one we've just seen in Mexico and elsewhere. Uh, the economic miracles always have the same properties. Uh, in Haiti, exactly as in Mexico, for example, uh, real wa wages dropped by about 50%. Uh, agricultural production was destroyed. Uh, the uh, uh, country was shifted over to import, as Siobhan was saying. Uh, the uh, terror continued, of course. Uh, there were export platforms in which women could be brought in from the farms to work for five or 10 cents an hour, uh, 11, 12 hour days to make, say, softballs, uh, dipping their hands into toxic substances so that the American manufacturers could advertise about how well they were bonded and so on and so forth. In general, it was an economic miracle of the usual kind. Uh, the terror continued after the fall of Jean-Claude Duvalier. Uh, it was fully supported of Was by Washington, of course, and the ambassador explained that, yeah, there was indeed terror, but it's just part of the culture. I mean, we're aspiring to do good works, but what can we do about it? That's the culture. Well, so matters continued until December 1990, when Washington made its first mistake. They allowed an election. Uh, no one had noticed that the plague of democracy had spread around the country. Uh, nobody pays attention to what's going on outside of the middle class, you know, the 1% up in Pétionville and so on. Uh, and this terrible thing had happened. Uh, they swept their own president into office. Uh, USAID and the National Endowment for Democracy and so on immediately moved in to try to undermine the government, uh, and they worked hard on it. Uh, nevertheless, it was highly successful as the State Department secretly and the Inter-American Development Bank and other international institutions pointed out publicly. 
though not in the press here, uh, but it was a political failure and an economic failure uh, because the government was not run by U.S. investors or the Mevs family and so on, uh, and because there actually were policies being undertaken that might benefit somebody outside the 1% there and the prime beneficiaries of a country's resources here. Uh, well, uh, then came the coup, uh, then along with it the huge atrocities, thousands of people being killed, and to the credit, the media did begin focusing on, on atrocities at that point, namely on the atrocities committed under the, the Aristide government. They managed to find, I think, a dozen or so uh, atrocities during the seven months in office, carried out mostly or maybe all by the army, and there was actually more coverage of those after the coup than of the hundreds of people, later thousands of people, who were being slaughtered by the security forces. Uh, the uh, Organization of American States instituted an embargo, uh, but embargoes don't mean anything if the chief mafia don doesn't take part. Everybody understands that. And George Bush announced very quickly uh, that the U.S. wasn't going to take part. In Feb a couple of weeks after the embargo was announced, and Bush reluctantly formally joined it, he also announced that U.S. companies were going to be exempt from it. And the New York Times explained that he was fine-tuning the embargo for the benefit of the, uh, of the uh, Haitian population, who they figured they'd sort of be better off if American companies kept functioning. Well. Uh, Trade with U.S. trade with Haiti was not all that much below the norm in 1992, though I don't think you could find that in the press here. It would have taken, it's, and it's hard to find out. It took me five minutes uh, to call the Commerce Department to get the figures. Uh, in 1993, under Clinton, uh, it went up by about 50 percent. Also, again, you have to, you know, I read it in Z Magazine and places like that, but the New York Times didn't have time for that story. Uh, the, uh, uh, in, in January 1990, the main part of an embargo, any embargo, is oil these days. That's what an embargo means, keeping oil away. Oil continued to flow without a stop. Uh, the big, rich families were building big tank farms and so on and so forth. Nobody could figure out how, uh, the, especially the CIA. In January 1994, the CIA testified to Congress that the coup regime was going to collapse almost immediately because all the oil had stopped uh, and they were monitoring it closely to make sure that no oil got in. Uh, and I suppose the Mevs family was laughing while they read this since they were the ones who were building the big oil tank farm to deal with all the oil that was pouring in. Uh, exactly how it was getting in was that it was getting in was not a secret to anyone, exactly, except maybe the American public reading the New York Times. But the, uh, how it was getting in wasn't entirely known, although it was revealed the day before the U.S. intervention. That was a Monday, remember. And on Sunday, the day before, uh, I happened to be monitoring the AP wires because it was obvious that something's going to happen. You know, Carter was there having dinner with Sid Ross and his slim, attractive wife and all that kind of business. Uh, but. Uh, so plainly something was going on, and the AP wires were, you know, the way they work, you sort of pour stories out, if you've ever seen these things. And they have a lead story all the time, and they had a lead story that day, too. The lead story, was, which was emphasized over and over, so that no journalist in the country could miss it. Uh, the, even if, uh, the lead story was that there had been a Justice Department leak. Uh, obviously, somebody was irritated. And someone in the Justice Department had leaked the facts and the documents indicating that the Bush administration and the Clinton administration had authorized the Texaco Corporation to continue supplying oil illegally. That is, that they had told them, they'd warned them that uh, it was illegal. Uh, but then when Texas, the same day they warned them it was illegal, they were called in and told there wouldn't be any prosecution. Uh, and when the Texaco Corporation came to the Treasury Department, with a proposal for a fake company that they could set up, which would then bring in the oil and you know, so on. They were informed that that was illegal, but that there wouldn't be any prosecution. And this went on right through the Clinton administration. So that tells you exactly what the uh, big headline would have been the next morning if there had been a newspaper in the country. The headline would have been, there never was an embargo. Okay? There never were any sanctions. There was never an embargo. Uh, the Clinton and Bush administration simply authorized the uh, 
big corporation, in this case Texco, to keep supplying the oil. Uh, well, like I say, it wasn't a big surprise to Fritz Mevs. You know, he was building the tank farms to take it in. Uh, but it, and it wasn't a big surprise to the American population either, because they never read it. Uh, I uh, was curious about this one. And actually, I wrote an article for Z Magazine the next day discussing it. But that comes out six weeks later. So I wrote it in past tense. I said, well, as we all know, you know, I'd, as once again vastly underestimated the servility of the uh, educated classes in the United States, it's a mistake I make over and over, uh, Monday, nothing was there, just how the sanctions failed, so we had to invade. Tuesday, it actually hit the press. I, I did a nexus search later because I was curious to see what happened. Uh, Tuesday, it hit the press. It was in Platt's Oilgram. Uh, that's an oil industry journal uh, which published the Clinton administration denial of what uh, they knew to be true. Uh, Wednesday, three days later, uh, there were about like 10 lines buried somewhere in the Wall Street Journal, also focusing on the government denial. But then it was starting to leak out in small papers, you know, like Dayton, Ohio, places where the editors aren't very sophisticated and they don't understand what's the wrong kind of news. Uh, and so it continued. In fact, to this day, there hasn't been a word about it in the New York Times or I think the Washington Post. It did make it to the Miami Herald, as far as I know, the only major newspaper. On October 23rd, like, like five weeks later, uh, they mentioned it uh, and actually did a pretty interesting story. They did their own investigation, which they described some of the other things that were going on during the so-called sanctions. Uh, for example, they described how Conrad Brandt, another one of the rich families, had just been in Miami under the sanctions to buy a $45,000 Cadillac. Uh, and they described the way the Bush and the Clinton administrations had, uh, had gone after the assets of the coup leaders. They did actually go after the assets of the chief of staff, Giampi, 15 months after the coup, and waiting until when they got there, there were $5.07 left, so he really got slammed. Uh, and that's the way the uh, sanctions worked. But since the sanctions failed, Obviously, what could we do but move in ourselves and continue aspiring to do good works? Well, uh, as I say, didn't surprise the Mevs and the Brants and the other, the rest of the middle class. Uh, it, uh, 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 it didn't surprise them either uh, to find out what the policies were going to be. Uh, if they were literate, uh, they could have read uh, what Americans also could have read in this case, thanks to Alan Nairn once again. Uh, who published, released the economic plan that was rammed down Aristide's throat, uh, which he accepted now that he's civilized and pragmatic instead of being an ideologue and fanatic. Uh, the, I don't think that one ever made the press either. I think it was only, Alan can say, as far as I know, it was only in the multinational monitor, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the central line of that economic plan said that the renovated government uh, of Haiti that we're reestablishing, where we're doing good works. The renovated government must direct all the foreign funds that come in to civil society. Then they define civil society, primarily the private sector, both national and foreign. You get it? American investors are Haitian civil society, right? But not Haitians in the slums of the hills. They're not civil society. They're the wrong people. They're the, just the ones who form grassroots movements and create these uh, germs of disquiet that have to be crushed by the armed forces that uh, have the proper orientation and understanding of our objectives thanks to their efficient training. Uh, well, that's uh, where we stand now. You've heard the rest of it. Uh, the uh, uh, government has now been broadened properly, you know, like the middle class is in there where they belong. We have real democracy. It's not a big surprise that Fritz Mevs, the, you know, the leading spokesman of the richest family, is the most enthusiastic person about the American intervention, you know, running around Port-au-Prince handing out posters of Aristide and so on and so forth. Uh, just to make certain that nothing goes wrong, uh, Aristide is not being allowed to finish his term. Uh, now, you can also read that if we're in a free society because it was pointed out in Canada 
uh, but in, which also pointed out that the decision of the Clinton administration not to permit him to finish his term, in their words, legitimizes the coup. Well, that's in fact correct. Uh, Aristide's term has another four years to run under the Constitution. That's not the way it's interpreted here. Uh, the interpretation here is that the coup years were part of his term, so he was serving it while he was in Washington. But that's not what the Constitution says, in fact, that everyone appeals to. In fact, the Constitution doesn't say anything about what happens when a military coup takes place and the president's driven out of the country and his supporters are massacred and so on. That's something you make a decision about. If you happen to think that democracy is of some interest, uh, you say that he finishes out his term, namely the five years. If you happen to have total hatred and contempt for democracy, you say he gets out of there fast so we can get our guy in, uh, civil society in some fashion. Well, that's what we do uh, with the support, as far as I know, of 100% of the educated classes. At least you can, do a, uh, you can do a study and check it out. Well, Clinton's been very much praised for his successes, and there's some justification in that. Uh, following Bush's plans, the program, and just general policy, uh, he did succeed pretty much in restoring the status quo before the mistake was made, that is, before the 1990 election. So the uh, traditional structures of power are pretty much back in place. Uh, the popular movements have been severely damaged, if not destroyed, uh, the, uh, though amazingly, uh, they're still functioning. Uh, they don't just uh, collapse and die the way people do here. Uh, in fact, we have a good deal to learn from the peasants and slum dwellers in Haiti, uh, not only lessons in democracy, although that would be a good beginning. Thanks. I want to thank Professor Noam Chomsky so much for, uh, well, that incredible background and speech and know that you'll be able to hear this over and over again on WBAI and on cable. Uh, it will be run by, on various local cable networks so that it gets out to a very wide audience, this entire event today. Uh, we did want to open the floor to some questions. We do have a few minutes for questions and I do want to let you know if you haven't contributed as much as you wanted to today, feel free uh, to go to the back of the room to the WBAI table. Uh, we're doing quite well. Again, we're trying to raise money today both for WBAI radio that brings you this kind of information as well as MPP, EDF, uh, the Peasant Movement of Papai Education and Development Fund that is trying to get this kind of information out in Haiti uh, through a radio station that it's developing, uh, working with women in Haiti as well as uh, advocacy work here in the United States to bring the voice of the Haitian popular movement to us in the United States because we certainly have something to learn from them. So again, feel free to go to the back of the room. Also at the back of the room is the Haiti Anti-Intervention Committee has a lot of books and information on that side. The East Timor Action Network is on that side with all sorts of information and videos uh, because Noam Chomsky has so inspired us around issues not only of Haiti and his analysis of uh, world terrorism bringing a different definition of terrorism uh, to the airwaves, but also on the issue of East Timor. So we do hope you get uh, to go back there. We also want to thank uh, La Detente, uh, the restaurant that has um, helped us today and contributed so generously. And the Campaign for Peace and Democracy is selling its magazine in the back that has an article on Haiti. Um, and we want to let you know about an event that's happening this week on Thursday. Captain Rockwood speaks. Uh, the um, 
captain who is facing an army court-martial for trying to rescue Haitian political prisoners in Haiti's National Penitentiary on September 30th of last year. Hear his story, and you can show him your support. Uh, that's going to be happening at the Newspaper Guild at 133 West 44th Street in Manhattan between 6th and 7th on Thursday, April 27th at 6.30, a very important event to go to. Um, well, why don't we take a few questions uh, for our speakers if you're interested in asking some. Yes. Okay. Can you speak a little louder? Uh, the question is, does uh, Professor Chomsky see an end to the benevolence of Western civilization, and how does he see that coming about? Well, remember that 70% of the American population disagree with 100% of the educated sectors on the case of Vietnam and say that it was not a mistake, it was fundamentally wrong and immoral, so that they're off the political spectrum. Remember that, notice that that 70% is an extraordinarily high number. Uh, one of the reasons is just technical. In a poll with an open question, we have a lot of choices. 70% is unheard of. Uh, secondly, no, everybody who said that made it up for themselves. They sure didn't read it in the New York Times or anywhere else, because nobody who has, is articulate is allowed to express that view, except way off in the margins. So 70% of the population were able to make up for themselves that the whole educated spectrum of opinion is off the wall. Uh, well, that's uh, because they knew some of the facts. Uh, and if people know other facts, I think they'll make the same decisions. In fact, that's exactly why there is such fear and hatred of Hamilton's great beast. That's exactly why the germs of disquiet and unrest have to be stilled. Uh, that's exactly why in the dependencies you have National Guards, you know, trained to crush anybody who lifts their head and why at home, where you really can't do that anymore, uh, you have propaganda at a level which has, is absolutely unheard of in any other society, including totalitarian societies. So corporate propaganda in the United States is a massive industry. I mean, billions of dollars have, are spent every year uh, to do what uh, the leaders of the industry call uh, fighting the everlasting battle for the minds of men, you know, controlling the public mind. Uh, and uh, that battle, they don't have to win that battle, you know. I mean, they'll win it if nobody fights back. Uh, how can this end? I mean, we all know the answer to that. Uh, that overwhelming mass of the population who is radically opposed to just about everything that's going on as soon as they find out about it, uh, if that great beast can uh, uh, be become, say, as well organized as peasants in the hills in Haiti under slightly harder conditions, uh, yeah, then they can uh, reconstitute the foundations of a democratic society and change things radically. Another question? Yes? The, okay. uh, first, she wanted to applaud Siobhan Jean-Baptiste and MPP for putting together a radio station, and then she's asking the question to Siobhan if the MPP will be putting forward a candidate in the June elections, and will he be a candidate? I'm going to say I'm not going to be a candidate. The first thing I'm going to say is that I'm not going to be a candidate for any post. Et cependant, euh, MPP gagnait euh, en pile bagaille exigé pour gagner vraie élection. Uh, however, the MPP is looking at several factors that would determine, you know, that would be a checklist for determining actually free and fair elections. Euh, mais 
dans le moment ça, nous pensons que nous ne pas capables de pas participer, participer dans la critique et le processus là, et participer également, dès que a gagné l'élection, n'a appuyé Kandinda qui a sorti dans le camp de la là. Euh... Premièrement, nous n'a critiqué le processus là pour lui, pour lui bien. Mais dès que y a une élection, nous pourrons participer dans le candidat quand la valance là. The first thing that we're going to be doing is monitoring the process itself, making critiques when there are problems in order to try and ensure that the process be the best that it can. And we will be supporting candidates, candidates under the Lava Loss banner. Euh, radio a libre de profiter de période d'élection pour capable faire éducation autour élection et pour comprendre limite élection yo et montrer nécessité pour voter changement qui donc voter quand la valasse So the radio will be used very much in this next period this pre-electoral period in order to talk about the limits of elections in and of themselves but also to encourage people that they can go out and vote for candidates of change and those would be the Lavalas candidates Et c'est certain et radio a, a dénoncé et tout candidat Makout qui t'a entré Koyo en bas secteur démocratique là. And certainly the radio station will be used to denounce any Makouts who try to put themselves under the democratic sector. Another question? Yes. Mm -hmm. I understand that the movement at the beginning the question is uh, MPP was originally agriculturally oriented now the questioner says he understands it's political Uh, does, has it neglected its agricultural base? Bon, pour nous-mêmes, toute bagaille c'est politique. For us, everything is political. Et sous Duvalier, nous pas de parler de mouvement, nous de parler de groupement agricole. Under the Duvalier dictatorship, we couldn't speak of a movement. What we Spoke of then were peasant groups. Et nous capables de dire, nous t'es servi avec agriculture comme activité paysanne pour faire travail éducation politique parce que sans pas de changement politique, donc euh, pas de gain changement dans la situation. Mon tout ça MPP a fait manger produit manger c'est politique lutter pour droit monde c'est politique. Tout ça n'a pas ces politiques net, net, net à l'école. And we also worked with the peasants in agricultural activities, but this was a way also to carry out popular education about the base issues that they were facing that were preventing positive changes for them. Because for us, everything is politic. Production of food is political. Support for human rights is political. Everything is political. Et c'est une erreur pour le monde à penser que il y a un changement économique qui est possible sans changement politique. Et pour me donner un exemple, et nous faisons une pépinière qui produit 50 000 pieds bois, et puis, euh, bon, pieds bois n'a bah, rien pour la politique, mais chef section avec attaché à l'écraser pépinière. Et pour vous donner un exemple, nous avons une tree nursery that uh, was producing 500 seedlings for us to plant. Now, you would say trees don't have anything to do with politics. Nevertheless, the section chiefs and the attaches, during the coup, they went and they destroyed that tree nursery. They say the trees were communist. So, in that sense, the people who say they don't do politics, it's politics that they do. So when someone says that they're not involved in politics, they are actually carrying out politics. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I, I thought that Alan Nair's suggestion to put the war criminals on trial and set up a tribunal, someone said Bertrand Russell, John Paul Sartre, the tribunal of the 60s is a really good idea. And I was wondering what other panelists thought about that and would they help organize or participate in that? Mm. 
Uh, well, you probably heard it, but he said putting these uh, people on trial as war criminals uh, was a good idea. And what did Professor Chomsky and Siobhan Jean Baptiste think of this? And would you? Sorry? And Ron Daniels. Well, well there, are, there are a couple of uh, people's tribunals. In fact, there's one called the People's Tribunal, uh, which uh, it's based in Italy. And it does carry out regular uh, uh, trials of uh, one of the most recent ones was of uh, corporate criminals involved in GATT and things like that. And they're very interesting trials. They have a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, one of them actually made the newspapers a uh, big story. Uh, they, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, they dealt with the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. And that one, you know, big stories about. But as far as I'm aware, that's the only one that's ever made the uh, press. But they do carry out regular trials like this, and uh, uh, others could do as well. I mean, you're not going to get governments doing it, obviously, or any power center. Uh, trials carried out, in fact, uh, Henry Adams, who I quoted before and is worth reading a century ago, uh, also pointed out that in regard to Haiti that the reason they paid the indemnity to France and not the other way around is that international law always has been and is the rule of force. That's true, yeah. That's international law, it's law of force. Uh, but people don't have to accept that. Uh, we can, uh, just as people can set up, you know, can work for a democratic society, they can also work for, uh, of course, symbolic punishment of war criminals. Now, I myself, you know, like I'm not in favor of the death penalty, so I don't think that these criminals should be hanged uh, the way they do to others when they catch them. Uh, but uh, uh, symbolic trials, I think, make perfect sense. In fact, they're a good educational technique. The Russell trial during the Vietnam War educated a lot of people. Um, and it's, it's, it's very important politically um, to break the dignity of uh, those who carry out uh, these crimes. Um, I actually think that this is, a, this is an issue and this is an idea that can have a lot of uh, appeal to, among the majority of the American uh, population. You know, one problem uh, is that uh, when discussions like this are held, um, you reach fairly small audiences of a few hundred people here, a few hundred people there, a few thousand people here, a few thousand uh, people there. Because the corporate press, um, they don't want to put these things on the uh, agenda. But as we head into political times, I think like we're heading into now, which will be very tumultuous, I think there will be more and more opportunities to reach a broader audience. And this is a question of whether you're soft on crime or not. I mean, that, that, really is, uh, uh, that really is what the uh, issue is. I mean, quite you know, seriously, I mean, not as a, re not as a rhetorical uh, thing. I think you have to be tough on crime. You know, I think someone who uh, uh, mugs an old person uh, on the street and uh, you know, takes away their, uh, uh, their purse and knocks them on the head, uh, I think they deserve to, uh, to go to jail. Uh, and likewise, uh, someone who, uh, uh, who oversees uh, a massacre uh, in which several dozen uh, old people are murdered, along with uh, you know, all kinds of other uh, people, uh, deserves an even longer sentence. I mean, it's, it's very concrete and very uh, simple. Also, you know, there was a question, the first question was, well, what, what are the chances that all this will collapse, that the, you know, the system of terror can be stopped? Well, it can only be stopped if you, if you fight against it, I mean, in a very uh, determined, very aggressive way. But I think that uh, right now, the way the U.S. economy uh, is changing, uh, the prospects for bringing this system uh, to a halt will actually be improving uh, considerably. Because up until a few years ago, uh, a case could have been made that the high standard of, of relatively high standard of living enjoyed by a majority of the American uh, working class and middle class was in significant part a result of uh, the exploitation of people uh, overseas and the, uh, the, the kind of exploitation that's carried out through overseas terror is sponsored by the U.S. government. I mean, there are arguments on both sides of it, but you could make a, uh, you could make a strong case for that. But now, 
with the uh, mobility of, of capital and the living standards of the uh, majority of the U.S. population being undercut precisely by uh, U.S. jobs uh, fleeing overseas uh, to places like uh, Indonesia and uh, Guatemala uh, and uh, Haiti and so forth, uh, where workers are terrorized to keep them from organizing unions, that creating a downward pull on wages, which in turn is used back against American workers. Now you have a situation where in addition to the moral outrage, where in addition to Americans being complicit uh, through, through their government in mass murder overseas, you also have their material interests, I mean, indisputably, clearly being harmed by this policy of repression overseas. So that makes it in, pract in hard practical political terms even more feasible to think about eventually, uh, well, or soon, bringing it to a stop. We're going to take a last question. Pam? Yeah, uh, just while we're on the subject of trials, the only trial I think following the coup is that of uh, Captain Lauren Brockwood, who tried to go into a prison to stay political prisoners. I'd be interested, Professor Chomsky, what, what odds you give him in, in this uh, trial, and uh, maybe Alan there knew of something on what was going on in the prison at the time of the uh, occupation itself, which is when he went in. Uh, if you heard this question, it's about Captain Rockwood, who's a uh, uh, faces a court-martial for trying to rescue Haitian political prisoners uh, when he came in with the occupation troops. And if I can add something, there's a demonstration. Is this a demonstration? Yeah. yeah. No, no, he's speaking. Oh, he's speaking Thursday, April 27th uh, at 6.30. Is that here in New York? Yeah. yeah. Uh, 133 West 44th Street uh, at the Newspaper Guild, Thursday, April 27th at 6.30. Uh, the prospects are, you know, it's like all of these things. Depends on the public pressures. I mean, the the the, politi the court system is very political, and it reflects the uh, pressures that are on it. If the pressures come simply from power, meaning state power or private tyranny, which are very similar, though not identical, if those are the only pressures, well, sure, he'll be sentenced. Uh, if the pressures come from the great beast out there. Uh, that we're all part of could be quite different. Uh, so I don't think that's a matter of prediction. That's a matter of choice of action. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add about Rockwell in particular. I mean, it's an amazing display of courage what he's, uh, he's done because, of course, when you defy, um, you know, it's one thing for, uh, you know, um, Americans like us, say, you know, journalists or uh, whatever to uh, to criticize what the United States is is doing, but wh when he does it from inside the military, uh, he faces quite severe uh, discipline, and it's a it, it's a great act of uh, courage on his part. One thing that I found very interesting in talking to a lot of the American GIs uh, on the ground uh, in Haiti was how many of them uh, were upset by the basic uh, U.S. policy. Uh, that they had been called in to uh, uh, called in to defend. I mean, uh, you, you heard. I mean, there were different views. I mean, there were, there was a lot of diversity among the soldiers, but you, there was a substantial number of them uh, who would talk about how uh, you know just uh, seeing the incredible disparity between the you know the Mevs and the elite up on the uh, the hill and everyone else living on the uh, on the brink of uh, of survival, uh, and the fact that the uh, you know, the U.S. troops there were basically there guarding those on the uh, uh, on the hill, and I I got the impression just from a lot of the troops I ran into that uh, many of them came away from the experience uh, with uh, uh, with a feeling that th this isn't right. Uh, we don't seem to be on the on the right side here. And Rockwell, uh, you know, uh, Captain Rockwood acted on it and put his put himself on the line. I just want to let people know, in addition to Captain Rockwood speaking this Thursday at the Newspaper Guild in Manhattan at 6.30, um, there's going to be some hearings at City Hall on May 10th, Wednesday at 1 o'clock. And they're around the issue of the children who are still, Haitian children who are still on Guantanamo. There are still over 300 unaccompanied Haitian minor children trapped on Guantanamo. Many of these children saw their parents killed by the paramilitary forces or they drowned in trying to escape in rickety boats. The U.S. government is flatly refusing to allow most of these children, as young as six, 
to join their relatives in the U.S., and yet at the same time, they've allowed the Cuban children under the similar conditions uh, to come into the United States. So there's going to be a hearing at City Hall May 10th at 1 o'clock um, on the plight of these children, and some of the families that want these children to join them will be testifying. Um, we are now going to end this program uh, with the general manager of WBAI, Valerie Van Isler. She has a few words to say, and I do want to remind you, as the situation with WBAI uh, is so critical now with the attack in Congress uh, on Corporation for Public Broadcasting, um, that whatever you can contribute, in addition, again, uh, with MPP, EDF, with whom we've had this joint fundraiser, their attempts to do projects in Haiti, you saw it in the video, you heard Siobhan describe it, their offices were decimated during the coup. Even the U.S. forces now, whenever Siobhan or the MPP speak up against occupation, come and threaten them. Recently, one of the U.S. captains came to them and said, we could destroy your offices in five minutes. This is what they're up against. They don't accept AID funding, uh, which is what is so threatening to the U.S. forces. They do accept support from U.S. grassroots organizations and U.S. just people who are in solidarity with the peasant movement in Haiti. So we do hope you can contribute if you haven't already. At the back of the room, Sybil Wong is there from WBAI to take whatever you can give. We appreciate every penny.